Hello, everyone. My name is Jerry, and today I'm here with Abe, David, Alon, and Colin, who are sitting in the front here. We are all graduate students from UC Berkeley in the Adept Lab at Berkeley. And today we're here to talk about two of the frameworks we've been developing at Berkeley over the past year, or past several years, uh, to realize our vision of end-to-end -end architecture exploration with RISC-V SOC generators, FPGA accelerated simulation, and agile test chips. Uh, so let's jump right in. So I want to set the stage first for why why are we a academic research group? Uh, you know why why are we a group of graduate students spending a lot of time and energy to develop all this infrastructure for developing our uh, RISC-V SOCs? And the reason is that it is a you know a golden age of computer architecture as we all know. Uh, the age of traditional scaling has ended. Moore's law is over, and uh, the microprocessor industry has driven by uh, everybody sees opportunities in custom microarchitectures and hardware software co-design. Um, at the same time, it is also a golden age for the entire open source stack, as many of the talks today also talked about. So uh, starting at the lowest levels, we have open source hardware being more and more available with more and more cores and IP blocks being published online for anybody to access. Uh, we also have, of course, RISC-V, the open ISA. And in the software world, the uh, open source software community has been you know, as strong as ever. Uh, open source operating systems, compilers, and applications continue to be the de facto standard in many areas. All right, so this is a you know this is a great world we live in, uh, but what are the challenges which face us? Um, well, there's several. First is uh, we, we've seen there's a lot of open IP, uh, but the question remains is you know to an end user, how do I use any of it? Right? What do I do with this collection of random uh, mismatched open source Verilog I collected off the internet? Um, and this sort of highlights the point that uh, IP is only as good as the infrastructure around it. And in many cases, if you just try to collect open source blocks off the internet and you know, put them together into your own project, you'll encounter this issue when you find there's no good infrastructure tying all of these projects together. Uh, the second challenge is even once you've put together a full system, um, and you typically what you want to do next is you want to run your custom workload on it. So I'm not talking something like Drystone or even CoreMark or Spec here, but something like TensorFlow, right? The end application which you are developing your uh, custom hardware for. Now, traditional approaches to uh, running, to getting performance measurements quickly for a custom hardware system involve uh, using something like software architectural simulators or models, but these tend to be slow and inaccurate, and it's difficult to have these uh, capture the specific behaviors of your custom design. Uh, but you also don't really want to wait until tapeouts to get performance validations of your chip. That's too long, that's too expensive, and you need your engineers to iterate more quickly on your custom design. So that's sort of the third point here as well. Um, you know, how do we perform agile tape outs with small teams? Uh, if you were in Jack talk, Jack's talk earlier, he mentioned how, you know, how do we make, how do we allow small teams of like 14 people create billion dollar hardware startups? Or how do we let uh, small teams of tens of graduate students develop test chips in an academic institution? Uh, and so at Berkeley, we've been developing these two frameworks, Chipyard and FireSim, to try to answer some of these problems. So the first problem, uh, where do I get a collection of well-tested hardware IP? So not just the IP, but also the tooling, the flows, and the software that all runs on top of it. Where is a you know, single place where I can get all, of this, uh, all of these resources and put them together along with my custom components to make uh, my custom hardware and design space exploration on it? So uh, to answer this problem, we sort of designed Chipyard, a framework for this. And the second challenge is, uh, once I have my system, how do I quickly obtain performance measurements of real software, real applications running on this uh, on the order of hour, taking the order of hours to get measurements out instead of days, so my engineers can continuously iterate on uh, their custom hardware. And uh, we developed FireSim, this tool, which uh, we will talk about later to answer this question. And what we see here is when we put together these two frameworks, we put together a library of IP flows and software together with a powerful simulation technology for evaluating hardware. Uh, we enable small teams to evaluate their hardware's metrics on uh, key metrics like uh, performance, power, area, and frequency, you know, quickly and easy, without much work, and with very small groups of people. Uh, so the agenda for today's uh, today's tutorial is um, we're gonna so this is the introduction and, and we're moving we'll move on after this into an overview of the components of Chipyard and all the components it encompasses. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, Chipyard a little bit more in depth. How do you actually build custom SOCs in Chipyard with your custom components on the side? Uh, we'll take a short break. Then we'll come back and talk about FireSim. So the FireSim simulation tool. What is it? What is the technology it's based on? Uh, what sort of flows does it enable? We'll also talk about the VLSI flow component of Chipyard, uh, and then we'll conclude this tutorial. 
So the first part of this tutorial is Chipyard Basics. Or, so in this section, it's gonna be a really fast blitz through a lot of components in Chipyard. So uh, tools, languages, modules, flows, and uh, it's gonna go really fast and that's okay. I just wanna give a, you know, a general overview of sort of what are all the components available to you when you start using the Chipyard framework. Uh, so the original motivation for Chipyard was actually that over the years, uh, we at Berkeley have developed an open source, numerous open source components for hardware. So things like languages, IRs, the, the ISA of course, and then other things like cores, accelerators, caches, uh, tiling, interconnects, peripherals, um, flows, simulation technologies. And the question now becomes, you know, to the user, I have this library of components of tools and generators and flows, how do I actually use any of this and put this together to build a cohesive system which I can actually use? And this is the question which Chipyard seeks to answer. So we sort of view Chipyard as a one-stop shop for hardware design where we sort of encompass all of these different components, the tooling, the generators, and the flows, and provide distractions around them such that users can work in you know, the specific area of, the, uh, of this entire framework that they need in without having to necessarily touch you know, the entire rest of the ecosystem. So to sort of demonstrate why this sort of uh, unified framework for hardware design is useful, um, I think it's useful to step through sort of one of the early flows, the simplest flows you can do when bringing up hardware, which is uh, doing software RTL simulation. So what does this flow look like in Chipyard? Uh, so in Chipyard, uh, we typically want to describe some custom configuration of a SOC. And this custom configuration will drive a library of RTL generators. So these include generators for uh, your cores, your accelerators, your caches, and your peripherals, so all the components you need to produce an SOC, um, as well as you, know, you typically want to include some custom block on the side so you can have your custom Verilog on the side as well. And then Shapeyard will abstract these generators and the, custom, and the configuration in such a way uh, such that the resulting artifact, when it's passed through the build process, it can uh, it ends up emitting behavioral Verilog, which can be passed down into your software RTL simulation tools. So I'll explain a little bit more about the technologies uh, in this in a couple slides. Uh, but you know, let's say you've, you've done software RTL simulation, what's the next step? Um, well, typically in de developing hardware, you want to you know, have faster simulation. So uh, we want to use FPGAs. In our case, it's typically using FireSim to do FPGA accelerated simulation. Uh, so in Chipyard, the vision is we have the same generator, the same set of generators, the same custom configuration for your SOC, and all you are changing is the back end, essentially, the, the RTL build process and the uh, end flow you're passing your configuration through. And so Chipyard abstracts all these processes away such that you know, to the user, if they're not interested in manipulating these flows, they can just take their same RTL, pass it through this different flow, and everything should still work. Uh, it's almost transparent to the user. And then the final case is for VLSI as well. Uh, the vision is that we can start with a custom SOC configuration and again with the same library of RTL generators, just pass the VLSI, uh, just treat the VLSI flow as a separate set of abstractions for a backend flow and then pass the same uh, sort of source hardware down through this flow. So backing out a little, we see that Shipyard provides a unified world where we have a single set of uh, SOC configurations, a single set of generators for hardware, and all the possible SOC designs that can be generated by uh, Chipyard can be passed through each of these flows for different use cases, whether you're simulating some design in FireSim or debugging it or evaluating its usefulness in like a warehouse scale, uh, or, if, or if you're you know, trying to actually tape out your design using our VLSI tool, Hammer. All right, so you know, I've talked about this sort of golden vision for what our flow should look like, what our flow does look like. Uh, so now I'm gonna go through sort of all of the tools and components which make this possible. And if you were at uh, Jack's talk on the Federation tools earlier, I think he, uh, some of this stuff might clear up uh, or share components with that talk as well. So Chipyard tooling. Uh, the, the first uh, infrastructure piece which is critical to many Chipyard components is Chisel. Um, and Chisel is a hardware construction language or library built on top of Scala. So I think it's, it's, easier to, it's easiest to explain what Chisel is by you know, first clearing up common misconceptions about Chisel. So what, what is Chisel not? Um, it is not Scala to Gates. It is not a form of high-level synthesis. Uh, when the hardware designer is writing Chisel, they are still thinking about the hardware they're placing. They're still thinking about you know, registers and wires and memories, uh, but it's just at a much higher level. And the third point, it is not a tool-oriented language. So Chisel is, is meant to be friendly to the designer, and it's meant to emit uh, a Verilog, which is friendly to the tools. So, um, so here are some properties of Chisel. 
Chisel is a productive language for generating hardware, which enables, so by being embedded inside of Scala, Chisel enables the hardware developer to leverage powerful object-oriented programming and functional programming paradigms in Scala uh, when designing hardware. And I'll show an example of this on the next slide. Um, the third point, Chisel, so, so one of the key concepts of Chisel is that it enables designers to build these reusable parameterized generators. So instead of building just one instance of a design, you build a reusable generator that can produce a variety of designs for, different, for various different use cases, and then you only have to pay the upfront design cost once. Uh, the fourth point is that uh, Chisel is designer friendly. It is meant to be low barrier to entry, but high reward. And so the, the example will illustrate this a bit better, but it's meant to be easily accessible to uh, you know, a hardware engineer who only has experience in Verilog. You can start writing Chisel much like you start writing Verilog, but as you get more familiar with the language, you'll start to realize all these powerful you know, tools that Chisel provides to you, and you'll start to be more, much more productive with Chisel. Uh, and the fifth point is that Chisel is backwards compatible. So uh, because Chisel ends up emitting Verilog, um, you can also incorporate Verilog into Chisel as black boxes. So you can integrate existing Verilog black box modules into Chisel or pass a Chisel, uh, a Chisel composed design into an existing VLSI flow that accepts Verilog inputs. Uh, so here is a very basic example of a very simple module expressed using Chisel. So here we have a uh, three-point moving average filter. Um, so you can see here that this module, uh, this very basic implementation is almost one-to-one -one with the Verilog implementation of the same thing. Right? We're defining a module, we're defining what its IOs are, the directions of the IOs, the widths, and then inside the body of the module, we define some registers, we assign some outputs, and you know, we, we've created our module. Right, so when I say Chisel is designer friendly and easy to learn, uh, what I mean is that you know, your, your existing hardware engineer is going to very quickly be able to write this style of Chisel. Uh, but the real power comes when they start leveraging more of the high order constructs. So instead of expressing just the single instance of a three point moving average filter, we can instead create a generalized, uh, parameterized, generator for a class of FIR filters. So in this case, our, uh, our module is parameterized both by the bit width of the input and output, and also this uh, sequence of coefficients to the filter, which can be arbitrarily long. So this can generate an arbitrarily long uh, FIR filter. Um, and you can see here that you know, we've parameterized the, the widths of the inputs and outputs. And we can also leverage some, you know, we can use some advanced uh, programming constructs, such as uh, you know, vectors as structures. Uh, we can use for loops, but even some more advanced constructs as well from functional programming, like zip and map and reduce, right? So you can see e even this is still a very, very uh, you know, basic level of chisel, but we can see that very quickly we're able to take a you know, simple single instance module and generalize it into a generator for hardware, for, for a variety of design points. Uh, so really, Chisel is only half of the story. The second half is Fertile, which is what we like to call LLVM for hardware. And so uh, if you understand how LLVM works, and the reason why LLVM has been so successful in the software compilers community, uh, it's because it provides these very nice abstractions describing what happens to software as it's being passed down from the front-end language into the, uh, the binary which you want at the end, right? So in LLVM, we take our front-end language, so in this example, C, C++, or Rust, and then we lower into this intermediate representation, LLVM IR. And then we have abstractions wrapping this set of reusable passes, uh, which can transform our IR and do various things like form optimizations on it, collect statistics on it, or, uh, and eventually uh, lower it into some specific target uh, assembly format. Well, we want sort of the same thing when we're building hardware, except in this case, the front end language, instead of it being C, C++, or Rust, our front end language is Chisel or even Verilog. And we can lower this represent the front end representation into the fertile intermediate representation. And then we have a reusable set of fertile passes which can uh, you know, do the same sort of things on this IR as the LLVM passes. So things like uh, perform optimizations, removing dead expressions, collecting statistics on the IR, and even just manipulating the module hierarchy arbitrarily uh, all through this very well-defined IR. And eventually we can lower this uh, fertile IR into you know, the Verilog uh, which we want to pass through to our downstream tools. And so the Verilog emitted by Fertile is tool-friendly and synthesizable, and this is the Verilog which your you know, downstream VLSI tools or uh, RTL simulation tools will consume. All right, so that's it for now, uh, describing tools. The next set of components in uh, Chipyard, which are you know, as important as the tools, is of course the IP. And we call uh, the set of IP in Chipyard the set of uh, rocket chip generators, because it's a set of uh, uh, chisel hardware generators which are integrated into the rocket chip ecosystem for hardware design.
So starting off, I want to explain what is Rocketship. Uh, Rocketship is a highly parameterizable and modular SOC generator. Uh, so it lets you not only replace the default Rocket Core with your own custom core, but also lets you explore more uh, aggressive customization options, such as adding your own custom coprocessor to the side of the core, or even adding your own IP, your own peripherals to the uncore of the SOC. Uh, second point, Rocketship is also a library of reusable SOC components, so it's not just an SOC, it's a library of SOC components. So things like uh, the memory protocol converters, arbiters, crossbars, and, cro and clock crossings can all be reused across different uh, Rocketship-based designs. Uh, it is also the largest open source Chisel code base. Um, it was originally developed at Berkeley, but it's now maintained by many, uh, Sci-5, it is now under the purview of Chips Alliance, and we at Berkeley also uh, contribute to, continue to contribute to Rocketship. And so Rocketship-based SOCs have been successfully used. Uh, so in industry, Sci-5 taped out their Freedom E310 using Rocketship. Uh, and in academia, we taped out the Hurricane 1 test chip. Uh, it's, this is a Rocketship-based SOC. Um, and so for researchers, Rocketship is great because it not only lets you, uh, you know, do tape outs, it lets you do tape outs uh, regularly and proceed across more and more complex designs. So you can see here a diagram of the uh, timeline of test chips we've produced at Berkeley since, back since 2011, I guess. And many of these are rocket chip based. Um, and we are continuing to build chips and you can see that they're sort of getting larger and larger and more and more complicated. And that's most, that's, a lot of that is because we've uh, exploited the flexibility and reusability of the rocket chip generator system. Uh, so now I want to talk about what, what is actually inside a rocket chip SOC. So what is the structure of SOC? Uh, so what I'm going to show here is sort of like the, the default topology. Uh, you know, rocket chip as a generator can generate sort of arbitrary topologies of your uh, buses and crossbars and uh, memories, but uh, in this case it's just the default uh, SOC. So in rocket chip, the tile is a unit replication for a core. Uh, so each tile contains, of course, the CPU. It also contains the L1 caches and the memory management unit. Uh, you have L2 banks in the SOC, which receive memory requests, so these are coherent and shared across uh, all the tiles. You have a front bus uh, through which uh, external MMIO peripherals can master your SOC. You have a control bus and a periphery bus, so your SOC can master external peripherals as well. And the system bus ties everything together. Uh, so starting off, the, the first component I want to talk about in a little bit of detail is the rocket in order core. So this is the default core uh, when you build a rocket chip system. So Rocket is the first open source RISC-V CPU. It is a five stage in order pipeline and it supports uh, the full uh, general purpose 64 bit ISA. So this is the RV64 GC ISA. So this includes things like floating point, compressed instructions, physical memory protection, supervi supervisor ISA, and of course, virtual memory. And what this means is that this is the standard ISA, oh sorry, and it also contains a, a parameterized BTB, BHT, and RAS, which can all be configured. And so what's cool, because it supports the standard 64-bit ISA, is that you can take off-the-shelf distributions of RISC-V Linux and boot it on Rocket. Um, and Rocket also supports this other interface called the Rocket Chip Coprocessor Interface. Uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail further, but this essentially lets you tether your custom coprocessor, which will execute uh, custom RISC-V instructions onto your Rocket core without having to make uh, intrusive modifications into the core itself. Uh, so the second core, the second core option in chip here that I want to talk about is Boom, or the Berkeley Out of Order Machine. So this is the first Out of Order RISC-V CPU. It is a, uh, is actually a parameterized generator for Out of Order cores. So I say this is like a one to four wide uh, Out of Order core because you can configure it uh, to be one wide or up to four wide. It is uh, standard a 12 stage Out of Order core. This has uh, been taped out before. So last year at Hot Chips, uh, the original author of Boom taped this out as Broom. It's the Brim chip. Um, and like Rocket, this also supports the full standard 64-bit uh, RISC-V general purpose ISA. So all, all the things you need to run real operating systems and software. So like floating point, compressed instructions, atomics, so on and so forth. Um, Boom also, you know, as an out-of-order core, has a pretty good branch predictor, has a parameterized BTB, BHT, RAS, and, and an open source implementation of Tage. And so we can get about eight misses per kilo instructions on core mark with a 27 kilobyte predictor uh, allocation. And so Boom shares the same interface as Rocket. So the, um, at the tile level, the interfaces are the same. So at the tile level, you can drop in a Boom tile to replace a Rocket tile um, in your chipyard or Rocket chip based system. 
Uh, so because a lot of people have been, you know, it's, it's clearly interest in high performance cores and the RISC-V community has been growing recently, uh, I just wanted to show you the microarchitectural diagram of Boom. So I don't want to go into too much detail uh, on this because that's not really the purpose of this tutorial. But, you know, since Boom is all open source, feel free to ask us any questions uh, offline or shoot us an email if you have specific questions about this. And it's all open source and available on GitHub for you to look at. Uh, so originally we were going to evaluate or show evaluations of Rocket and several configurations of Boom on Drystone, but then two days ago Dave Patterson told us that Drystone is the measles of computing, and in, in this, to, and to make an effort to avoid spreading contagious diseases, uh, we decided to emit these scores. Um, and the second thing he said during that presentation was that the the first person who shows mBench scores in a RISC-V summer presentation will win a autographed copy of his textbook. So uh, we have the first uh, mBench evaluation at the RISC-V summit, I think. Um, and so you can see here we've evaluated uh, Rocket and several configurations of Boom ranging from one wide to four wide, all running uh, uh, you know, the, the set of 19 mBench benchmarks. Um, I do know this is preliminary, so this is just, I compiled this using whatever tool chain I had available uh, on my computer last night, and this is not, you know, the standard mBench evaluation method, so please don't use this to compare other cores to so this. This is just for, you know, uh, internal relative comparisons. Um, all the systems here have the same uh, cache structure, so it should be pretty fair at uh, capturing just the effects of the core. Um, yeah, this is, and this is pretty cool. There's also the mBench uh, benchmark is also a superset of the benchmarks in CoreMark, so I won't even show the CoreMark scores right now. Um, right. So another level of configuration or customization available within Shipyard and RocketShip, beyond just selecting which core to use, uh, is the Rock Accelerator interface, which I mentioned earlier. So Rock is the RocketShip coprocessor interface. It enables you to attach a custom uh, module for a custom accelerator onto the side of an existing Boomer rocket core. And this custom module will execute uh, some custom RISC-V instructions for the empty opcode space in RISC-V, which you can specify. So what will happen is, um, is that if you drop your decoupled rock accelerator onto the tile next to, uh, you know, the core, the core will automatically, uh, you know, it, it will generate the hardware to do this. It will automatically decode your custom instructions and send the instruction bits to your accelerator. And then it will provide interfaces for the accelerator to not only write back into registers of the core, but also access uh, other tile level components like the page table walker, the TLBs, uh, the L1 data cache, and even give it the opportunity to go out to the system bus to talk to main memory. So this is actually a very flexible interface, and at Berkeley we've used this to design a variety of accelerators targeting a variety of applications. Uh, so here's some examples of things we've built, a vector accelerator, mem copy accelerator, machine learning accelerators, and Java garbage collecting accelerators. And uh, some of these, many of these are open source and available in Shipyard as well. Uh, so moving out beyond the tile level, uh, Sci-Fi recently open sourced a multi-bank shared L2, which plugs into the Rocketship system. So we use this within Shipyard as well. It is a fully coherent L2 of, config of configurable size and associativity, and it supports things like atomics, prefetch hints, and uh, you know, I think cache clear instructions as well. Um, if you don't want to use the L2 cache, that's great. That's fine as well. We also have a uh, the Rocketship has a non-caching L2 broadcast hub, which can be uh, placed instead of the L2, and this will do coherence between multiple tiles without any caching. Um, and to the backing memory, you can go through you know, various memory converters to go through some protocol to talk to external DRAM. Um, in the control, uh, hanging off the control block, the control bus and the core complex, we have a variety of peripherals. So of course we need the boot ROM, which contains the first stage bootloader and the device tree. We also have the platform interrupt controller, the core local interrupt controller, and the debug unit, uh, through which you can communicate to, with the cores using DMI or JTAG. Uh, so we have a bunch of other blocks in Chipyard as well. Um, so first of all is Hardfloat. Uh, this is a, parameterized, a set of parameterized fiscal generators for generating arbitrary uh, compliant hardware floating point implementations. Uh, we have IceNet, a custom NIC for FireSim simulations, which I think we'll talk about later. Um, Sci-5 has their Sci-5 Blocks repository, which is a open source repository of various useful chisel peripherals, so stuff like uh, GPIO, SPI, and UART. Um, and we at Berkeley have a different, another set of utilities called TestChip IP, and this is a set of utilities which we found to be pretty useful for chip bring up. So things like a tethered serial interface for communicating with your chip, uh, or a simulated block device. Um, we also have a Huacha decoupled vector fetch rock-based accelerator for executing uh, another vector specification, another vector instruction set. 
And then we have the SHA-3 educational rock accelerators. This is more meant as a uh, sort of an example of how to integrate a SHA-3 uh, rock accelerator into Chipyard and Rocketship. All right, so at this point, we've, uh, I've described a lot of blocks, a lot of IP. And the next question is, you know, a lot of these things talk through memory, their MIO peripherals, or their caches, or cores, or tiles. Uh, what, what's the interconnect that connects them together? And this is actually TileLink. Um, TileLink is a free and open chip scale interconnect standard. It supports multiprocessors, coprocessors, accelerators, DMA peripherals. Uh, it provides a physically addressed shared memory system uh, with cache coherency, and it provides a MOSI equivalent protocol. And a conforming SOCs can be optionally verified to be deadlock free. Uh, Tiling also provides several different protocol levels with increasing complexity. So this is things like this is sort of like Axi4 Lite versus Axi4. Um, we have you know the the, the uncached lightweight protocol uh, compared to the very heavy uh, cached protocol. And there's a variety of widgets within Rocketship for converting between, uh, not only between various different Tilink uh, protocol standards, but also between Tilink and other standards. So between Tilink and Axie 4, for example. And we also have things like crossbar generators uh, with converters and performance checkers for Tilink as well, which you can just place down to your uh, Tilink based design. Okay, so at this point, we have, uh, you know, we have sort of all the components we need to build our SOC. We have our cores, accelerators, caches, peripherals, and our interconnect. Um, and now we have a custom SOC configuration to specify how we parameterize all these generators, and then we throw into a pot, stir, and we get our RTL at the end. Uh, but there, there are still a couple challenges left to solve here, and there, there's two which I want to talk about a bit. Um, so the first, there's two challenges with configuring generators. The first is, uh, how do we allow parameterization of interdependent generators? So the, the, what drove the, this problem is that the memory system in an SOC is really a function of you know, every other component in the SOC. So you can't really independently uh, specify the parameterization of the memory system without considering everything else that it's connected to. And so I'm gonna talk about diplomacy uh, very briefly, which is sort of a framework for, abstract, for automatically solving this problem. Uh, and the second problem is how do we flexibly and reusably describe a system parameterization? So how do we describe this custom configuration in such a way such that we can uh, iterate on it quickly and explore different, uh, explore different points in the design space uh, clearly and you know, understand exactly what we're changing in the system? And the solution to this is, uh, the long name is context-dependent parameterization, but we're just gonna call it rocket ship configs. Uh, so talking about diplomacy first, uh, the problem which I mentioned earlier, uh, interconnects and memory systems are difficult to parameterize correctly. Uh, you have a complex interconnect graph with many nodes, but each node is independently parameterized, but they all depend on each other. So how do you actually get all these nodes to sort of understand uh, how they should be parameterized? Uh, so the solution is called diplomacy, which is a framework for negotiating parameters between chisel generators. It uses a graphical abstraction of connectivity and a two-phase elaboration process uh, where during the first phase, every node in this graph exchanges information with every other node in this graph. And in the second phase, uh, once they've figured out their parameterization, they can elaborate the RTL and generate the RTL for each node in this graph. And this is used extensively by rocket ship tile link generators. Uh, so some things which diplomacy can, uh, which diplomacy will negotiate between different nodes are stuff like physical memory attributes, so the modifiability, executability, and cacheability of arbitrary memory regions. Uh, ordering requirements, uh, widths and presence of fields and wire bundles. And some applications of this automated uh, parameterization, parameter negotiation framework are, you know, for example, you can automatically insert these TL monitors which will check tiling adherence. And you can automatically place this within your tiling graph uh, without having to you know, manually specify every point where you want to check for coherence uh, or correctness. Um, you can also discover atomic automata topology violations with diplomacy as well. So an example, so a very fast example of how diplomacy works. Uh, you have you know, this very basic topology of an SOC where you have an L1 iCache, an L1 data cache, some external peripheral mastering your system, and then uh, your clients can access the boot ROM or the L2 or the uh, external memory through this set of crossbars. And so at the beginning, your clients know how many source ID bits they have, and your managers know which address ranges they're responsible for. But this information needs to be propagated both ways. So in the first phase of diplomacy elaboration, uh, you know, all the managers will learn what source ID bits they have from the clients as information is propagated through the graph. And then the uh, correct address ranges will get propagated upwards back to the client. So now every client will know uh, which address ranges are legal accesses. And this all happens you know, at uh, or before elaboration time. So when RTL elaboration comes, you can use these parameters to uh, generate hardware. 
And so because diplomacy provides this uh, automation of sort of this uh, interconnecting all these components, we can use it to generate very complex uh, interconnect graphs without having to really think at all about what's going on behind the scenes. And so this is the diplomacy generated graph for just a single core uh, rocket ship based system. Uh, you see here we have a tile, uh, inside the tile we have you know, the iCache and Zcache, and it's going through this like uh, this huge network of buffers and crossbars and buses to go to connect to all of these uh, different components. And what diplomacy does is, you know, it lets us abstract all this away so we don't really have to think too much of, about the details of all the connections uh, inside this SOC. And we can build, you know, much more complicated systems, like uh, with much more complicated graphs this way. Uh, the second point, uh, the second challenge with configuration, uh, the solution I described was called Rockship Configuration System. And this, uh, so two days ago at the keynote, Martin Fink mentioned that it's sort of, you know, homogenous. Uh, systems where you just have a couple cores connected to a memory are boring, and what people really should be building is building heterogeneous systems with different accelerators, all talking to each other and all connected to some memory. Um, and so we've, this powerful configuration system within Rocketship enables you to express these complex SOC designs very easily. But I won't go into to too much detail about this now because Abe will talk about this in the next section. Uh, so one last thing before I pass it off to Abe. Uh, we can't forget about software. So within Chipyard, we also have this other tool called Fire Marshal. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time today to go into too much detail about what this tool does. But uh, essentially what it's trying to do is it lets you abstract away the specification for the platform or the board uh, on which you will run software uh, from the actual software you will run, which is called the workload. And then Fire Marshal provides this sort of automated build system where it reads your specification of your board, it reads your specification of your workload, and it will configure all these different components like your RISC-V Linux, Fedora, and BuildRoot, and your uh, custom workload binaries, and passes through this automated workload generation process to get your boot binary and disk image, which you can run uh, on your SOC later. So if you're interested in this, uh, please check out the GitHub, and there are docs available online as well. Uh, so at this point, I think I'm going to pass it off to Abe, or I guess we have some time to take some questions, if there are any. I'll pass it off. Thanks. Uh, so you've accounted for the memory addresses uh, through your diplomacy. Yeah. And uh, how do you account for uh, uh, interblock sideband connections, like uh, you know, interrupts going from devices to the PLIC? Right. So the interrupts are actually so y if you look very very closely at this diagram, you can see that like diplomacy also creates nodes for interrupts as well. So okay. diplomacy can handle not just uh, tiling but also your, your interrupt graph as well. Okay. So if I have sideband connections, I can use yeah, you can represent them uh, using. Okay. This. All right, uh, I think I'm gonna pass it off to Abe, who's going to talk about Chipyard in a little bit more depth. Uh, so building custom SOCs in Chipyard. Hello. Uh, so hi everyone, my name's Abe. Uh, I'll be going through a little bit more depth on how you actually work with Chipyard, how do you actually add a project to Chipyard and create this config that Jerry mentioned earlier. So the main goals of this particular section, this really quick section, is to understand what's happening in this huge configuration system. There's a lot of different knobs that you can tune and change, so how do you actually change those knobs? And then we're also gonna go into how do you add your own custom accelerator into this flow. So if you have your own uh, particular piece of Verilog that you wanna add in, this is a little bit of an example on how you might do that. So this was the diagram that Jerry showed uh, earlier, and it basically shows that you have that custom SOC configuration uh, going into all the RTL generators, and then at that point, you kind of split off into your different flows, whether it's software simulation, FPGA simulation, or working with an actual tape out. So what we're gonna focus on first is this uppermost portion. So understanding how do you actually create this configuration that uses all these IP blocks that we give you inside of Chipyard to create something that's useful and interesting. So as a little bit of a dive into what Chipyard looks like. So this is a little bit of a, uh, this is the repository structure. And basically we have it split up into different sections. The first section is your generator section. So this is where you're able to find all the things that Jerry mentioned. You're able to find rocket chip, you're able to find boom, your different types of accelerators, uh, your interconnect standards, your caches, basically all the different components that you kind of uh, want to mosh together into a particular SOC design. Then you have your simulators. So in this case, we uh, support Verilator and VCS and FireSim, which will be discussed a little bit later on. But you can basically take this RTL design and then pass it uh, to your simulation flow. 
In terms of software, we also have uh, FireSim also inbuilt into the repo. So as Jerry mentioned earlier, you're able to build Linux images, Fedora images, and all these other custom workloads. Um, so you can actually run something interesting on your SOC. And then finally, we have all the different sets of tools such as Chisel and Fertile, which you actually use to make this entire system work. I'll also point out that there's a example project here. So you don't have to take my word for it that it all works together. You can actually see how it all works. So we have this concept of an example project where you're able to see how you mix in a single core system, how do you attach maybe a couple uh, boom cores, out of order cores, how do you add accelerators. You can see all of that inside of this example chipyard project. Um, so you can actually get different examples of heterogeneous configs um, and create something interesting out of the gate. In addition, we also provide a lot of the extra glue that you need to create an SOC. So you have things such as your test harness, so you can actually plug into things like uh, Verilator and BCS. You have your top level modules uh, specifying what's actually going to the outside world off chip. And then you have all your accelerators, uh, examples on how to do uh, Verilog black box integrations. So it's a great place to start to see uh, how do you actually work with this environment and how do you actually add your particular custom IP. So with that being said, uh, let's actually go a little bit into the, the configuration aspect of uh, Rocket Chip and Chipyard. So this is kind of the initial setup that you'll have. You'll have a, something that's called a custom config. And a custom config is a way that you can mix in all these particular one line uh, uh, strings. So in this case, Rocket Chip system base config. And basically you're gonna build up your uh, SOC from line by line. So in this case, we have a base config which sets up an initial set of default parameters for rocket chip. Then we can specify what does our top level module look like. We're gonna have some sets of buses. It's gonna be a rocket chip system, so we add this particular line. Then the most important thing is we start adding uh, particular pieces of IP. So in this case, we're gonna add a couple cores. In this case, we're gonna add boom cores. It's gonna be some sort of default configuration. And then if we wanna actually parameterize them, we just add an extra line. So as you'll see throughout this example, all I'm doing is adding a single line by line by line, and it's changing how this entire SOC looks like piece by piece. At this point, let's say we wanna add an L2. It doesn't come with an L2 by default, so I can go ahead and add an, a single line, which uh, creates uh, this particular L2 cache. I can go ahead and add a uh, accelerator to the system, so I add a Huacha, which is the vector accelerator that was mentioned earlier by Jerry. I can go ahead and add a boot ROM. I can go ahead and add GPIO, so I can actually interact with the outside world in some meaningful way. Um, I can actually add things outside of the top level module. So in this case, I'm adding a block device inside of the test harness so that we can actually do something more interesting with Linux. And then finally, I can specify the size of memory that I'm actually targeting. So as you can see, line by line by line, I'm building up this entire system from scratch from the basic parameters that are shown in the base config and then adding different types of cores, uh, caches, uh, accelerators to the system. However, that's not exactly it. You can actually do a lot more. So if I wanna create a heterogeneous config, in this case I wanna have some sort of in-order core uh, and then out-of-order cores or like a big little system, you can go ahead and do that and it's, uh, it's not too hard. You just have to add this one line with and big cores and adds a rocket. Or I can go ahead and add all these different types of accelerators. So I can have it so that the in order core has a convolutional neural net accelerator, assuming that you have it done. You can have the SHA-3 accelerator attached to one type of out of order core and then you can have Huacha, the vector accelerator, attached to another. I can also change the ISA that some of these cores run. So in this case, rocket, I'm changing it to make it uh, RV32 instead of 64GC. And then I can also add other sorts of debugging infrastructure. So I can add JTAG on the outside. I can also add SPY, but that's not shown. I can also change what order the tiles are uh, laid out. So I can have Rocket be the tile zero, the first heart in the system, and I can have Boon be some of the later ones. I can also make it so that each of them are on a different uh, clock domain. So I can have the Boom cores be clocked at three million gigahertz and the rocket core clocked at maybe like one megahertz, whatever you feel like doing. So as I showed here, it's basically a top up approach to building out a config and you can change the system arbitrarily where each of the components adds up and creates this unique system. So great. Now we've gone into a little bit on how this configuration system works. 
But the most important thing is how do you add your custom IP? So we're gonna use a SHA-3 accelerator in this example. Um, we don't have enough time to actually uh, have you go through it uh, on your own laptops, so I'll go ahead and show it in just slide form, but you can go ahead and follow this example on the main shipyard repo right now. So as was mentioned earlier, we care a lot about uh, our own accelerators and our custom IP. So we wanna create our own vector accelerators, our machine learning accelerators, but we don't wanna make sure that it fits inside of the system and it integrates easily. So in this case, we're gonna use uh, the SHA-3 accelerator. So in this case, the SHA-3 accelerator is already pre-implemented for you uh, inside of the repo, but we'll use this as an example. It implements the secure hash algorithm three, and the details of it is not exactly important. What actually matters is how do you actually integrate it in the system. So going step by step, so the first thing that you wanna do is actually add your sources into the repo. So as I mentioned before, you have that section that's called generators, which is all your different IP, uh, IP blocks that you wanna create uh, an SSE out of. So you're gonna go ahead and add this IP into your generator section. So it says, it's as easy as get cloning into that particular section or copying your code, whatever it might be. So in this case, we're adding the source code SHA-3 uh, into generators. Then, to make sure that it works with Chipyard, you just need to change four lines inside of this build SPT file. And what is this build SPT file? It's essentially a way that you can uh, tell the dependencies uh, of your main project. So you need to tell it that, you need to tell the build system that it exists. So that's the first three lines. It's saying it exists in generator SHA-3 and that it depends on rocket chip and something like chisel testers, which is another uh, repository that we use. And then we also need to add it into a top level SOC project. So in this case, we're using example as the top, oh, sorry. We're using uh, example as the top level uh, project that mixes everything together. So all we have to do is add the, the particular SHA-3 line uh, uh, in the example section there. And then after that point, all we have to do is create a configuration with it. Um, so what exactly does that look like? So if I create my basic SOC configuration, so here all we have is the base config with a couple core, or with one core, excuse me, an L2 cache, and then a boot ROM, all I wanna do is add an accelerator, and that's, it's, it's, at, it's as easy as that. So all you have to do is add that single line that adds with SHA-3 accelerator, and that sets particular parameters con to connect it up into your system. So with that, uh, I'll go on, to how to actually connect an accelerator into your system a little bit more. So what's exactly, what's happening behind the scenes? Okay. So there's kind of two ways that we view integrating something into rocket ship, especially if it's uh, a peripheral or an accelerator. So the first case is MMIO. Um, so here outside of the tile, you're gonna have your MMIO peripheral that connects uh, to the system bus. And basically all you have to do is uh, read write to uh, MMIO registers. And so you have examples of this already inside of the Chipyard code base if you wanna implement something like a UART or if you wanna implement something like an ICE NIC, uh, uh, a NIC, excuse me. Um, so you have a lot of examples of how to do an MMIO uh, peripheral. But what we're doing in this particular approach is using a rock accelerator. So this was already mentioned a little bit by Jerry beforehand. Um, and this essentially takes the decoded instructions coming out of the particular core, in this case, boom or rocket, and sends it over to the decoupled accelerator the SHA-3 accelerator. And you have access to things like as your, uh, you have access to things like your page table walker, uh, your dcache, and also out to the rest of the system through the system bus. And you also have many examples of this inside of Chipyard 2 um, with uh, vector accelerators and more. To dive in a little bit more into kind of what the signals that are coming back and forth, at least within the tile. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's a decoupled interface, so it's a ready valid interface where you send over the particular function that you wanna run on the accelerator. And then you also have access to the operands that come uh, out of the core, and then you're able to write back into a destination register. Additionally, you're able to actually access the memory system either through the cache or uh, through outer memory through something like the system bus. So in this case, this is kind of the, the nitty gritty of what you need to do to integrate it. Um, Basically, you have to implement a mix-in, so that's the single line change that you add to your configuration, and all it's doing is changing parameters. So this is a good example of how you actually change one of these uh, generators that are able to create a variety of different types of designs, and all you have to do is change these particular uh, flags. So in this case, we're 
making it so that it's a one, uh, one stage SHA-3, we're adding fast memory, uh, and then a little bit more boilerplate at the bottom, which is that build rock section. And so once you have something integrated in, you create your accelerator, all you have to do is create this single mix-in, and then you're basically good to go. Now at this point, uh, you have your SOC uh, design ready to go, but you actually want to get the Verilog out. So you created the configuration, and now you need to figure out how do I actually get Verilog out so I can run it through my synthesis flow, so I can actually run it through software simulation, my FPGA flow. So now we're kind of shifting from this top level portion uh, down to the bottom portion, which is actually going through the fertile flow and going through uh, software simulation. Um, later on in this section, in this Chipyard tutorial, we'll actually talk about FireSim and VLSI, but I'm just gonna be focusing on the, the software portion. And it's really as simple as this. All you do is type in a single command where you point out the particular config. So in this case, I created this SHA-3 config or that huge, uh, that, that huge configuration that had the multiple lines building up the SOC. All I have to do is point to it and then say, uh, make Verilog. And at that point, it'll dump out Verilog in this particular folder, this generated source folder, and you'll have things like your top level Verilog separated out from your harness, you'll have your DTS uh, added there if you wanna run Linux, you'll have uh, your reg maps for your MIO, and any other collateral that you have out of your design. And the nice thing about this is that Chipyard and the Rocket Chip ecosystem allows you to add your own particular files so that they automatically, uh, uh, they, it allows you to add your own particular files to run software or build a simulator and you can basically dump it all in one place so that when you create a design, you have all the collateral in one place that you can see it. So to go a little bit into more depth about the, the Verilog flow, so we created this configuration that parameterizes the chisel. Um, so you have your configuration and all your different particular IP blocks. So in this case, you have your SHA-3 uh, configuration then you actually want to elaborate it into fertile. So you want to take that chisel representation and convert it into a, a fertile netlist. And then once you have fertile, you can actually generate out the Verilog. So in this case, in Shipyard, we automatically split up your top level from your harness so that you have separation uh, between the Verilog. And it's very easy to add your own custom fertile transformations. So as was mentioned earlier, fertile is, uh, LLVM-like where you can add your own passes. So you can add passes to analyze the circuit, maybe do some preliminary timing analysis. Maybe you want to reorganize the module hierarchy without having to change the chisel. Um, or you can add some more simulation collateral. Anything of the sort you can probably do. And then at that point, you created your Verilog. You actually want to create your simulator. Um, that make command essentially creates your, your simulator out of it. Now to look at the, the software itself of how the, the accelerator software looks like, um, as I mentioned before, you essentially send over a couple pieces of information to the, the accelerator. So in this case, you have your sources, destinations, and for example, what function to run on the accelerator. And then the accelerator is gonna send you back a busy signal. So is it done or not? Looking at the particular C code a little bit. So we have uh, expanded C macros, and essentially these C macros expand out into your custom opcode. Um, and then you can basically specify this, uh, this C macro and program the accelerator. So in this case, uh, we set up the SHA-3 accelerator to uh, specify the input and output addresses, and then in the next line, we actually compute the, the hash and set the length. So not too hard, it's just a couple of C macros and you're off to the races. You can actually create something that's interesting. You can wrap this in a C library that's more intricate um, and do anything else you want to look at. So in this case, set up and run your accelerator. And with that, I am running out of time, but uh, again, we all, uh, in Chipyard, we use the fire marshal utility utility to build uh, the binaries. So in this case, you're gonna have your C file that was shown before. You're gonna give it a fire marshal configuration which specifies different aspects of how you wanna build the particular binary. And then all you have to do is run it and you, could, you get a binary out. And to actually simulate it, it's also as easy as writing this particular make command. So it's just gonna be this make, the particular config that you're targeting, the binary, and then run binary. And you can also do things as dump waves, you can get commit logs out of it, and any other collateral that you might get out of uh, simulation. So it's fairly plug and play uh, to kind of get started from an SOC and get something useful out. So with that, 
uh, I basically did a really quick dive into the, the configuration, uh, your different IP blocks that you actually add together and compose a bigger system, and then go through a uh, software RTL simulation. And I'll point out that all of this information, um, I went through it very, very quickly. We have a read the docs, we have documentation up, so you can see how this all works. Um, I think we're gonna give the slides out afterwards or uh, the conferences, so you should be able to see how this all works and try to integrate your own design in. And with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a break. Uh, after the break, we're gonna talk about FireSim and VLSI. Um, so at this point, feel free to stand up, walk around, sorry? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, at this point, you can feel free to stand up, go to the restroom, walk around, get water, and we'll be standing up here if you guys have any questions on this particular section. And we'll start back up in about 10 minutes uh, talking about FireSim and VLSI. Thanks. So the next hour, um, I'm gonna be speaking for the first half about FireSim, what it is, why you might wanna use it, and basically it's two constituent components that differentiate it from commercial offerings. Um, in the latter half, Alana Mid, my colleague and co-developer, is gonna talk about some cool use cases that um, use certain features of FireSim that would be hard to you know, build yourself if you were just doing conventional FPGA prototyping. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started. So my name's David. Um, I'm one of many people who've worked on FireSim for a large part of their uh, PhD. Um, I'm one year from graduating, so hopefully this is one of my last talks as a Cal student. Um, but one of the big goals of our research lab is to bring down the cost of building chips, right? We want small companies to build chips too. Um, and of course, NRE is a huge barrier to this, right? And unfortunately, if you zoom in, as you all know, there are just uh, myriad uh, contributors, right? So if we're gonna overcome this, it's going to have to be a large joint effort. Um, and so the role of FireSim in reducing the, uh, the cost of building a chip is by trying to make, you know, to try and build a better um, full system simulator to do pre-silicon validation verification and software development, which are the sort of quintessentially the largest costs in building a chip. Um, so if you were going to build an ideal full system simulator today, obviously, you know, we'd want it to run as fast as silicon. It would have to be as detailed as silicon, so it was a useful debug target, and then we could do useful pre-silicon validation. Um, ideally, you would have all the benefits of a software simulator, right? It should be easy to debug, it should get full visibility over our machine, um, we should be able to recompile for it instantly. And most importantly, if we're going to bring down um, NRE, it needs to be cheap, right? And so the adage goes, you can only pick two or maybe two and a half of these. Um, naturally, if you buy something like a palladium, you do really well, but um, obviously palladiums are expensive, right? So if you wanna do something that's um, more inexpensive, Looking around, the only basis technology you really have to use are FPGAs, right? And we're going to use FPGAs to host cycle accurate simulations. Um, but instead, we're going to rely on having an open source tool chain to compile things that look like FPG or harbor emulators. Um, we call them FPGA accelerated simulators. And we're going to do this with an open source tool. Um, so, fortunately, in our group, we've been the beneficiary of a number, a number of key changes over the past 10 years. Um, now, obviously, you can buy time in the public cloud and have access to a large elastic supply of FPGAs. Um, we use Amazon EC2, but of course there are other providers. Um, we rely extensively on Chisel and especially Fertile. Um, Fertile is uh, our hardware IR, as you heard earlier, and it's really the basis for doing all the transformations that we're going to apply to take your design and to map it into some sort of decoupled latency insensitive form that's going to be an exact model of it. Um, it's not really useful to build one of these simulators or a framework to simulate uh, silicon if you don't have access to designs, right? And so here we rely extensively on taking rocket ship based designs and pushing it through our compiler. Um, and of course, rocket ship implements the RISC V ISA, which is what brings us all here today. So, and you know, there's a growing body of software you can run on a RISC V machine. So if it runs on a RISC V machine, you can run it on a FireSim simulation. And so we run you know, Fedora-based distributions all the time, we run spec all the time, uh, we've run memcached on very large network targets, and I'm very excited to say that the space of applications you can actually run on these simulators is growing quite rapidly. Right? 
So at a high level, um, what FireSim is, as I sort of alluded to this earlier, is it's basically open source hardware emulation, uh, which we call FPGA accelerated simulation. Um, so we're going to take your design and map it onto an FPGA such that it executes deterministically, right? And such that it is provided with a series of IO models that are timing faithful to the actual system you're trying to build, right? Um, that makes it useful for doing validation, um, as I will show later. So FireSim consumes your design, like I was saying. It also needs a bunch of auxiliary hardware and software models to sort of close your simulation world. And then finally, uh, some sort of workload description, which will describe how to run, what you want to run, and how you want to batch that out to the cloud. And as output, you're going to get sources for this, late, uh, this deterministic latency insensitive simulator, like I was saying. Um, and we provide this tooling to batch out large number of simulations to the cloud with what we call the manager, which I'll describe later. And so if you're going to come away with maybe three distinguishing features of FireSim from this talk, um, the first of which is FireSim builds something like a hardware emulator. We're not building prototypes here. We're not going to just be synthesizing rocket ship into LUTs. And I'll explain how that happens in a moment. Um, we use cloud FPGAs. That's not strictly speaking required, but it has lots of upside. Um, for one, it gives us as uh, researchers uh, access to very large FPGAs that would be very hard for us to buy otherwise, right? And of course, it's an elastic supply. So if you want to run spec in parallel on 48 different simulators, you can do that. There's no way we could buy 48 of these FPGAs. Um, and another nice feature is it makes it really easy to collaborate because if I build a bitstream and I can spin up an ist instance and run a simulation, my collaborator on the other coast can do the same thing, right? I, we don't have to have the exact same local board to do this. And most importantly, it's open source. So if you have access to EC2, you have credits, maybe you got a research grant, um, all of this tooling is free to use. Okay, so for the next five minutes, I want to motivate why we built this thing and why we're not just prototyping. I think. Considering that many of you are from industry, this is going to be mostly self-evident, but it's not always. So if you take a design and you try to synthesize it directly onto an FPGA to build a conventional prototype, you sort of encounter um, this quintessential problem. So if you have your design and suppose you're targeting, say, you know, TSMC 28, and it closes timing at one gigahertz, your system is going to have a d real DRAM memory system, right? Maybe it's DDR4. It's going to expose, say, 100 nanoseconds on average of memory latency. If you try and take that SOC and you synthesize it onto, say, a, like a Vertex Ultra Scale Plus, you know, maybe you'll close timing at 100 megahertz if you're lucky. Of course, to model DRAM, you're going to have to use the hardened DRAM controllers, the DRAM subsystem attached to the FPGA. And that's a real DDR4 memory system. And so because it's a real DDR4 memory system, it exposes, again, 100 nanoseconds of latency. And art artificially, your SOC model sees a DRAM memory system that is wicked fast, and so it's not useful for doing, uh, you know, pre-silicon validation. Um, so this is just one example of the sort of underlying problem that pervades FPGA prototypes, and that is that they couple simulated time to wall clock time, which is not something that, you say, a software RTL simulator does, right? It shouldn't matter how many clock cycles your x86 machine takes to execute the RTL simulator for it to get the same result. Um, and so, the consequence of this is let any sort of variable latency in the FPGA is exposed directly to the simulation. And as a result, uh, that means that things like DRAM might not be an accurate model of the thing you're trying to build. Your simulations aren't deterministic, which makes it hard to find bugs, hunt down bugs, reproduce bugs. Um, and if you want to share results, say, across different hosts, so you could have someone try and simulate the same design on a different FPGA, there's no way those two hosts are going to produce the same simulated result. So, like any good simulation work, we try to make um, a distinction between the thing we're trying to simulate, which is what we call the target, and the host, which is the machine that's actually executing that simulation. All right, and so the target in this world, if we go back to the previous example, is your SOC plus maybe some additional IO modeling, which like creates a closed simulation world. And the host is just going to be an FPGA. In our case, there's actually going to be a CPU attached to this FPGA because we do co-simulation. 
but you know, in practice, it could be something else too, right? Like a multiprocessor is a completely valid host. And so much like you would use, say, Verilator or VCS to compile a simulator that ran on a multiprocessor host, you're going to use FireSim to do so for an FPGA host, right? I'll explain this analogy in more detail later. So the underlying task we have to achieve is we need to somehow decouple wall clock time from simulation time in an FPGA. And the way we do that is essentially with what we call host decoupling, which is just a fancy way to say that, you know, we're going to be gating a clock in a clever way, right? And so this is where Fertile comes in. So we take our design, um, you know, it's going to be emitted by rocket ship um, as Fertile. Uh, we're going to transform it by essentially clock gating it. Um, then we're going to instantiate models for all of these different I.O. devices that we can't just synthesize into LUTs. And we're gonna connect everything together with, with a series of queues. And so this represents uh, a graph of latency insensitive models that represent the target exactly. Of course, different models might have different requirements. So in the case of DRAM, you can't model DRAM memory system in LUTs. So you're going to still use the FPGA attached DRAM, but this time as a backing store, right? A sort of functional model for the DRAM memory system. The timing model lives in fabric and the functional model mostly lives off chip. You plop the rest down and now you have a sort of complete simulator that you can synthesize that should execute deterministically. And as a result, because this timing model can arbitrarily decide whether it wants to produce tokens or not based on the arrival of functional requests from the physical DRAM memory system, um, we can provide a deterministic and timing faithful DRAM model. All right, so this sort of faithful timing modeling of DRAM is just one example of one thing you can do with this technology. Naturally, because simulations execute deterministically, it's easier to reproduce bugs. Um, it makes it possible to take the same design and target two different FPGAs get the exact same simulated result, which is nice for collaboration. Um, but perhaps the biggest feature that you get when you decouple the target from the, the host is now it's possible to do co-simulation, put models in software, and have them communicate in a way that's deterministic, right? Um, so this is done all the time in industry, of course, but um, this is something that I think is relatively novel for you know, an open source economic offering. And of course, once you have the means to stall simulation locally on, say, the FPGA, well, you can tie an arbitrary number of FPGAs together. And that was the basis for our ISCA paper in which we simulated a thousand, a thousand node data center, right? You use a lot of FPGAs, you tie them all together in this um, latency insensitive graph. Uh, now you can cycle accurately model an entire data center. Um, and again, we're using this, this decoupling trick if you want to instrument your machine without changing its behavior, um, you can just stall the clock and then read arbitrary state off of the machine, right? You can add arbitrary counters to count certain events without changing the simulated behavior of the machine. And in our paper that we just published this year at ICCAD, um, we started applying optimizations that, you know, were f applied frequently in the prior work to take you know, designs that are, are parts of a design that are known to map poorly to an FPGA, like something like a multi-ported register file, and essentially resynthesize them into a form that is very resource um, efficient. So in this case, we could use a dual-ported VRAM and do something equivalent to multi-pump it, right, um, to save a tremendous amount of, of uh, FPGA resources. Okay, so, in the next three slides, I'm just going to go over some of the cool use cases for FireSim. Um, Alana's going to go into these in greater detail. The first of which is modeling very large network machines. And again, this is what we did in our ISCA paper. Um, because you can tie together a simulator over multiple hosts or a very large distributed host, you can model arbitrarily large systems, right? And so in this case, the sort of the like, killer um, Experiment in our ISCA paper was we modeled a 1,024 node data center, each of which has a, each node was a four core machine based on rocket chip. Um, we ran 512 uh, memcached servers, talking to 512 mutilate clients, and then we could measure real things about, you know, the per, like, we can measure real aspects of this system, um, like 
latencies through various parts of the data center, right? So across the uh, top of rack switch or across you know, the whole data center. Most of our work to date though um, is mostly around modeling you know, single SOC designs, right? And so if you tear out all of that hardware and all of that infrastructure to model a network, you're left with a thousand independent simulators, right? And that gives you uh, an enormous degree of parallelism to do design space exploration, for instance. And so we frequently run spec um, with its reference inputs on a sort of farm of machines to improve our throughput. Um, and so in some of our papers, we've you know, synthesized, say, five different points, five different instances of rocket ship to evaluate some microarchitectural feature and then run spec on all of those points in parallel. Um, and because we have this ability to stall the clock, um, we have uh, the privilege to add a whole bunch of useful verification um, and debugging tools, right? So the first of which is assertion synthesis and print synthesis. So in Chisel, much like you know, Verilog, there are sort of structures that you use to assert certain uh, predicates are true or to print to a file, for instance. We can synthesize those and pull them off the FPGA. Um, we have the ability to automatically integrate ILAs, which are sort of um, xilinxes in circuit debuggers uh, using chisel annotations. Um, we have a special bridge module which will let you capture a trace coming off of one or more cores of your system and capture them into a file. Um, again, without changing the, the behavior of your simulated system. And you can annotate any arbitrary signal in your chisel and we can generate a sort of hardware performance counter that again, won't change the behavior of the simulated system. Okay. So in this latter, you know, uh, 14 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about the sort of two distinguishing pieces of FireSim. But the first and most important thing to call out is that, you know, FireSim is a library um, in Chipyard. So this morning we sort of, or in the previous hour, we sort of looked at the left branch of this tree, but now we're going to be looking at the center, which is where FireSim lives, right? We're gonna take the same RTL that any Chipyard generator was emitting and we're going to try and build an FPGA accelerated simulator from it. So FireSim is with the other simulators in Chipyard, it lives in Sims, FireSim. Um, you initialize it with this script um, there's a whole bunch of documentation, so I'm not gonna go into too much of the detail here. But suffice it to say is, if you have a design in Shipyard, you can simulate it in FireSim. So up until this point, I've sort of been focusing more on the process through which we take a design and we map it into this deterministic form. Um, the piece that's responsible for that is called Golden Gate, which is our compiler. It's a fertile compiler. It automatically converts ASIC RTL into sources to build this FPGA accelerated simulator. The second piece is what we call the manager, and this is essentially um, what you'll use to batch out builds and batch out simulations to EC2 F1. Or, yeah, just EC2. So if you were to clone FireSim today and poke around its internals, there are sort of a few key directories you need to be aware of, the first of which is sim. Uh, this is where the compiler is. Um, this is where you basically put together your simulator and do RTL simulations of the simulator itself before you decide to build a bitstream. Um, there's a make base build system here and this is how you tell Golden Gate what sort of design you want to um, build a simulator for. Deploy is where the manager lives. This is where you'll be running out of if you're running simulations on EC2. Um, in platforms, we have project definitions which are going to sort of host the Verilog we generate for the different FPGAs we support. And then finally, software. Um, this is historically where we've put all of the build system and sources for building software that you actually want to run on your target machine. Uh, increasingly though, this is moving into Chipyard. And fortunately, Nathan's not here today, um, but he's built Fire Marshal, which is this tool we use to build um, full, to build customized distributions that we run on our simulators. Okay, so I'm gonna focus for the next couple of minutes on the compiler a little bit more. Um, so like I said, the role of this compiler is to take some fertile and annotations that have been emitted by 
uh, chipyard generator and convert it into this decoupled form. So at the top we have the fertile and the annotations. There's also an additional compiler configuration which tells Golden Gate, you know, what sorts of debug features do you want to enable? What sorts of area optimizations do you want to enable? Um, and then as output you're going to get, you know, Verilog which represents this now decoupled simulator um, and a header file which contains the memory map for this simulation. You take the Verilog, you synthesize that into an FPGA shell project, you take the header and you link that in with your software models to build the CPU hosted part of your um, simulator and you're ready to go at that point. Um, we also emit a bunch of default plus args, so like any other simulator, there are a bunch of things you can change at runtime and these are controlled with plus args. So. In the interest of time, I'm gonna try and skip through this, but in the ICCAD paper, we started applying some of these area optimizations. I think this is, uh, this is an area that a number of us are looking, for, are looking at in detail um, because we want to be able to make FPGAs cheaper to use. Um, we're really trying to shy away from doing multi-FPGA partitioning in favor of doing these resource optimizations that take multiple cycles. And so in this paper, we applied one optimization to multi-ported uh, multi RAMs, um, and this let us fit two more boom cores on one of the EC2F1 FPGAs. And we have much cooler optimizations in the pipe, and I think this is one of the compelling reasons you might choose to try FireSim. You can think of it as Thash OS for FireSim, because it's really just optimizing the resource utilization. Um, so when you want to build a simulator, um, once you have your design in Chipyard and you have it passing an RTL simulation in Chipyard and you want to build a simulator, um, you're going to go into that sim directory and invoke the compiler using make, right? And there are three main tuples here. There's the design variable, which maps to the model variable in Chipyard, this target config, which is the config variable in Chipyard, and then again, the platform config, which is the thing that you're actually passing to the compiler to enable particular um, optimizations. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of the compiler at a very high level. Now I'm gonna talk a bit more about manager, because this is what most people use most of the time. So to draw a second analogy, much like you would use, say, Slurm to manage a cluster you have locally, um, batch out workloads to that, um, we use FireSim to do that for a sort of ephemeral cluster that we spin up and spin down in, um, on AWS EC2, right? So some background terminology first. Um, when you start using FireSim, you're going to, the first thing you're going to do is spin up a head node, which we call the manager instance, and this is where you're going to be running this manager program and running these um, compiler, uh, running the compiler builds, right? But then we have two, no two notions of a, a farm, right? We have a build farm, which is something we use to build bit streams, which will become part of our simulator, and then we have a run farm, which we use for running simulations. And so the run farm has FPGA instances, the build farm is only compute. Um, and so if you go into the deploy directory in FireSim, you're going to see these three INI files, or four INI files, that configure this manager program. Um, the first two control which designs you want to build bitstreams for. And there's two parts. Um, there's this recipes.ini file, and this has a set of entries that describe those three variables I mentioned earlier. These again map to um, the same variables you'd use in Chipyard, right? And so the top three sort of specify um, what design you want to build, and then there are some options that let you additionally specify whether you want to use um, particular EC2 instances or whether you want to use spot instances, for instance. Then you have a config build.ini which says, okay, of that complete list of recipes, I want to build some subset, right? And so at the top, there are some additional build configuration um, settings to let you save money. And then here we have a list of the recipes you actually want to batch out. So in this case, we'd be building five bit streams in parallel. And each of these builds will go to a different AWS instance. And once you have done those builds, you can actually share the newly compiled bit streams with your collaborators using this um, part of the file on the bottom. And so the process for doing a build sort of goes as follows. Um, you call this one command, firesome build AFI. It spins up this ephemeral build farm, one instance per design. It 
deploys the sources for each of those points to each of those instances. It runs Vivado. This is going to take some number of hours. Um, and then as they finish, uh, the manager is going to copy back results. So you know your checkpoints, all of your report files. Um, and then it's going to incrementally tear down this build farm to save you money. And this all happens by typing one command. And when you're done, you're left with uh, a hardware da database entry. And at a high level, this just has the image, which in, AGF, in um, EC2 parlance is an AGFI, but it's really just a bitstream. Um, and then some additional hooks, which you can override to say, link in custom software models or change default plus args, right? And so you're going to build up this enormous database of bitstreams that you've compiled and you can use them anytime you want in the future. Right. So now, once you've built a couple bitstreams, we ship some by default, um, you can go about running a simulation, right? And so this is configured using the um, config runtime.ini. And again, there are three parts to this file too. There's this target config part, um, which describes the nature of the target you want to simulate. And most importantly, there's going to be a string which calls out one of the entries in your hardware database, right? Um, then at the bottom, there's a workload description, which might be something like spec to say, um, this will be a JSON file that will say specify every single benchmark in a particular suite of spec. So if you want to run all 10 in parallel, you could do that. And then at the top, um, this will call out the sort of hosts you want to use. So the number of FPGA instances you'd like to use, the, num the, the number of compute instances you need to do the network simulation, so on and so forth. Um, and so once you've configured the config runtime.ini, you can actually go about spinning up the simulation. And so much like uh, the build AFI command, the first thing you run is fire sim launch run farm. This spins up all the instances you asked for. Then you call infra setup, which copies again, sources for your simulation to each of the nodes, um, and then programs the FPGAs, right? At this point, you're ready to actually start booting a simulation. And you do that with run workload. And so in this case, type run workload, Linux boots, memcached starts up, and your experiment starts running. At some point in the future, you know, one of those machines is going to power off, our, the simulator detects that and begins to tear down the whole simulation for you, um, copying back any results you produced. So it's really like this run workload command that's doing all the interesting stuff. And so if you, you know, were to spin up an instance today and run this command, you'd get something that looked like this. Um, and as your simulation is running, the manager is going to give you a running dialog of the state of all your instances. So if you're running a large network simulation, it'll tell you uh, whether all of the nodes are actually running and what their states are. You're free at that point to actually just SSH onto one of these um, hosts, right, and attach to the running simulator. And then you can interact with that running simulator much like you would real hardware, right? So in this case, you can attach to a screen and log into the actual simulated target. Um, and the manager, importantly, bakes in a lot of automation for copying back results. And there's really two classes of results, right? There's stuff that is going to be generated in, in the host file system. But there's also going to be files that you might generate as part of your workload in the target's file system. And you can specify host and target files, and the manager will copy them back automatically for you. Right, so as I said, at some point, one of those nodes is going to power off and simulation is going to begin to tear itself down. Um, if you want, you can leave the instances running to run another simulation, or you can just terminate them um, using this terminate run farm command. And that sort of completes the life cycle of a fire sim simulation. Um, and so with that, um, that's the end of my part of this talk. Um, it was sort of a really quick tour. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we have a lot of docs um, which describe all of this in greater and more precise detail. Um, I hope at this point it's sort of become clear why we built this thing um, and why you might consider using it. Um, and now Alon, or we'll take some questions first, but Alon will be talking about um, debugging and running network simulations in um, Firesim. So we have a couple of minutes for questions first, if anyone's interested. Yeah. Um, 
At the current time, so the question was, are there provisions for running locally? Currently, no. A lot of the, the infrastructure is in place. Um, like we, we had this support before and we removed it. Um, but we're going to bring it up again in the future, sometime this year. Okay, so thanks. No problem. Um, how much does it cost to rent uh, or to you know, use an FPGA cluster on Amazon Web Services? I didn't even realize they had such a, a service. Do, uh, do you know what the hourly rate is approximately? Right. So the question was roughly how much does it cost to use EC2 F1? Um, so, the, so there's two types of like models you can use. You can, you can pay for what's called an on-demand instance, which would give you guaranteed access to one of these FPGAs. And so for one FPGA, that would be about $1.60 an hour. You can also use these things called spot instances, which you might be evicted from if there's more demand for on-demand instances. And the price for those are variable uh, based on how much demand there is. So that could be anywhere between, like, say, 40 and 80 cents. Okay. Very reasonable either case. Thank you. Yeah. They're big FPGAs, like I said. The, they use these, what essentially amount to, like, LVO data center accelerator cards, and they're, like, you know, six, $7,000 to buy. So. So maybe this is a question for the debug session, but I'll ask it now. Do you have the capability to snapshot and reinstall so that you can run something to a certain known good point if you're debugging something and then not have to waste all that time to re-spin that all back up? Right, so the question was, do we have like state snapshotting and replay? Um, we did. <laughs> um, I broke that feature. Um, I, I'm going to have to bring that back, though, for my dissertation work. So hopefully sometime this year we'll have that feature back. Like, there are many ways you can go about implementing that. And the way we did it in the past was to basically duplicate the state of the entire machine and produce what we call a, a shadow scan chain so that we could run the simulation while scanning out. Um, but a lot of our designs now are very big. So we'd like to use the FPGA JTAG to pull stuff out. Um, so there's, there's a bit of work there, but a lot of people want it, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But we have to then, like, a lot of people want to replay that snapshot, not just on the FPGA, but if, say in a software RTL simulator. There's some extra work there, too. And, you know, one of our students, Dong Yu, one of the initial large contributors to this project, used those state snapshots to do energy modeling. So you can pull out the state snapshot and you can do some sort of state correspondence between a gate level simulation and the RTL simulation. Then you can see the gate level simulator and do, you know, like you can pass that to prime time and get uh, actual power numbers seeded from an FPGA simulation, which would be pretty cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, for that uh, 1000 node simulation, what kind of dynamic performance you were getting in terms of clocks per cycle? Good question. Uh, so the question was, what sort of simulation performance are we getting? Um, that varies wildly. So for the network simulators, as Alon will point out, those can run quite slowly, maybe three megahertz. So that represents, well, it depends on how big of the network you're simulating, right? If you simulate a thousand node data center, it's going to run at three megahertz. If you're running, you know, a 16 node simulation, that can run at like 20 megahertz. If you're running an unnetworked simulator, that depends on, you know, the behavior of your target memory system, for instance. And so it can go anywhere from, you know, the frequency of the FPGA, which might be 120 megahertz, down to say like 50 or 60 would be uh, more typical. And again, that's happening because, you know, if you're modeling a fast DRAM memory system, you might have to stall to wait for the FPGA DRAM to produce the result. That leads to an, a slower simulation throughput. That's you know some multiple of the FPGA frequency, right? So if you're running at 120 megahertz, but you have to stall every other cycle on average to wait for DRAM, you're going to run at effectively 60 megahertz. And that number is variable and depends on the behavior of your simulated machine. So yeah, it, like you said, it, it depends dynamically on the behavior, like the software you're running on your target machine, the sorts of optimizations we've enabled. So some of these debug features come at the expense of simulation throughput. And the way we can like sort of cheat that is we model longer latency links between parts of the simulator, right? So that allows for these things to decouple in simulated time. 
So for instance, if you wanted to model a one nanosecond latency link between part of the simulator that ran on the CPU and part of it that ran on the FPGA, like that would run really slowly because you have no host time to hide this one nanosecond target time, right? So this is very, the simulation components are very closely coupled. They can't decouple from each other. Um, but if you model, say, you know, 10 microsecond link latency, it's going to be 10 microseconds in target time before, you know, the receiver can do anything, can, can like causally do something based on that thing, right? So. Yeah. So basically, yeah, exactly. No. The, the synchronization happens with tokens, which are essentially like messages passed on a per cycle basis but the models themselves can decouple arbitrarily from each other. So like different parts of the simulation can be many cycles ahead of other parts of the simulator. And that can happen like locally to an FPGA too. Cool. Sorry, I took a bunch of a long time. So. <laughs> Hi, uh, so now we're gonna dive a bit deeper into the debugging features that David mentioned earlier. Uh, so we've all been in this situation where the RTL design guy says, I passed all my assembly tests on VCS, we're all good, and the uh, validation or software dev guy, but I ran Linux, I tried to run my driver, it still doesn't work. Where's the bug? Uh, so, sorry. Uh, so what we do in FireSim is we use, essentially, try to get as close as we can to these features of hardware emulators with our low-cost FPGAs and get deep into simulation time using various, uh, we call it uh, deep, uh, FPGA debugging techniques. So using resources we have with FPGAs or that we can use using these back pressuring uh, mechanisms that David talked about. So stuff like ILAs or synthesizable assertions, printfs, and, and trace widgets, which we're gonna talk about now. Uh, so the first feature I'm gonna talk about is uh, ILAs. So we mentioned that snapshotting is obviously the ideal situation we want and dump the entire waveform. Um, but we can still use resources that the FPGA, provide, FPGA vendors provide us to get some visualization of waveforms uh, because that's what we need a lot of times as hardware designers. So all FPGA uh, vendors give us the, this IP block called uh, ILA, Integrated Logic Analyzer, and in essence, it's an IP block that samples a bunch of signals that were probed on the FPGA, continuously samples them into some, uh, into some BRAM, and then offloads it upon some trigger uh, uh, to main memory of the host. Uh, so we have continuous recording of some sample window, and we can uh, trigger this offloading uh, by some uh, probe, probe signal. And one nice thing about these cloud-based uh, AWS instances is that these ILAs can are interfaced through some uh, debug bridge and servers, so we don't actually need to be on the, F, on the a, FPGA instance that we're running on. We can actually connect to this debug bridge from anywhere from our local machines, from our manager machine, or anywhere that we can uh, run Vivado and, and load these VCDs. Uh, so what we did in FireSim is we automated this entire process of integrating ILAs. So if you've ever integrated on an ILA, you, need, you, you know you, you should either use some uh, Verilog annotations, which did not really work on the AWS instances when we started with this, or you need to generate the IP, uh, uh, the ILA IP block in Vivado and then wire it up uh, in your top level in, in your Verilog. So what we did in FireSim is we automated this entire process. Uh, you can annotate a signal or a bundle of multiple signals uh, in Chisel using this FPGA debug, uh, uh, debug function, and we will do all the wiring for you. We will generate the ILA IP, we'll punch out the relevant wires up to the top, uh, we will start the debug bridge and, and configure all the relevant IPs. Um, and you can just uh, connect to the IP using your remote Vivado and, and, and get a waveform from your sample signals. Uh, so whenever we try to evaluate these debug features, luckily we have a, a boom team that uh, uh, generates a lot of bugs. Uh, so uh, one example that we will uh, look at here is uh, the boom team trying to debug some erroneous uh, page fault. Now this happens after Linux boot, so we don't want to wait for a VCS simulation that will take us uh, a, day or two, or a day or two. Uh, so we annotate a couple of signals using this FPGA debug uh, annotation. We get the waveform using uh, auto ILA. Everything is generated automatically. And then the Boom team can continue and debug from there. And we'll, we'll continue looking at this, uh, this type of error with a few more debugging features uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so what, if, what are kind of the pros and cons of using uh, the, these uh, ILAs uh, with FireSim? 
so first of all, the, benef uh, the best pro is what you see is what you get. We're tapping into the FPGA signals. This is exactly what we're getting. We're not emulating any of our peripherals or, or looking at things not as they are in the FP FPGAs. And we're still getting FPGA simulation speeds. So we're talking about order of megahertz compared to order of kilohertz in software RTL sim simulation. And we're using these real-time triggers. So we can change our trigger um, um, based on uh, the waveforms that we're seeing and trigger our LAs at different, uh, at different times and get a different uh, uh, set of uh, uh, time frame window we're looking at the waveform. Uh, the con is that whenever we want to change these probes or change the signals we're looking at, we need to resynthesize re the image. This can take a few hours. Uh, we have this limited sampling window size, and obviously this consumes FPGA resources, so we can't tap all the signals uh, in our design. So what are some al uh, alternative debugging technique techniques we can use? Uh, so we can take a, a, a page from uh, the debugging techniques of the software folks and use printfs. Um, so uh, David mentioned that uh, synthesizable print printfs were uh, presented uh, in the dessert work, and this essentially lets us do kind of software-style debugging. So we have a print statement, uh, we can have fields that take the values of various signals that we have and essentially generate prints every cycle that an event happens uh, and, and, and work as if we were debugging software. So we want some visibility to a signal, we print its value upon some event, and, and, and we see whether that event happened or not. Um, so one nice feature about uh, these printfs is that, is that they also uh, print the exact cycle where the event happened, where we printed the printfs. So this is very helpful in trying to measure cycles between events or trying to understand patterns of behaviors between events. Uh, and again, going back to this boom example, we can also use uh, these printfs to print various traces or behaviors that are of interest to a processor. So in boom, uh, they want to verify memory consistency um, because Obviously, it's out of order. You, uh, those things can have an impact. So you print uh, a set of values, whether it's uh, uh, the data, the, uh, the PC, the memory command, memory size, uh, for e every time you have a memory operation. And you can get some uh, set of, of prints with a cycle value and, and try to verify your memory consistency. So very similarly to the synthesizable uh, uh, printf, so we also have synthesizable assertions. So assertions, we're all familiar with them from uh, any verification environment and also from uh, software development. And we want to make sure that the assumptions that we're making when we're writing software or hardware hold. Uh, so whenever we, we, ha we write assertions in, in Chisel or Fertile, so those are usually emitted in Verilog as a, as a fatal statement. And that doesn't uh, hold uh, too well with FPGAs. So what was done in, in this dessert work, very similar to synthesizable printfs, uh, is that you want to uh, generate some synth synthesizable block that will communicate with your simulation host, stop the simulation at the exact time the assertion was, uh, was, assert what is, was asserted, and offload the relevant message and the state uh, that, that caused that assertion, uh, that assertion, assertion to, uh, to pop. So again, going back to a boom example. So we want to assert when the, ROP, when the reorder buffer is behaving unexpectedly, when it's overriding some valid entry uh, or, or in, in a variety of other conditions. And uh, these conditions don't always happen when we run a 50 line assembly test. Sometimes they run very deep after Linux boots. So this, an, this is an example of one of these assertions uh, that popped up. Again, you had a write back that occurred uh, to, uh, that, uh, to an invalid ROB entry. And this happened um, ve very quickly into Linux boot, which in FireSim takes you about three minutes to get here. But if we would have ran this in a, in a VCS or very later simulation, uh, this would have taken us about 62 hours to get here, so a very long time. So assertions are something very useful when we're doing verification or validation uh, using FPGA sim simulation. So what are kind of the pros and cons of using these synthesizable printfs or assertions? So again, we still get debugging using FPGA simulation uh, speed. We still get real-time trigger-based assertions or, 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 uh, or printfs. These consume a very small amount of FPGA resources if we compare them to ILA or, or, or some other features we'll talk about. And another big advantage, especially when we're talking about the Boom code base or the rocket ship code base, is that a lot of, a lot of these code bases have been pre-annotated with a lot of assertions. So if you're trying to stretch coverage or you're trying to stress test with a variety of accelerators, then you already get these assertions. So if you, we hooked up our custom machine learning accelerator, but that caused some memory consistency uh, an, an anomaly or some uh, weird raw behavior, 
we will have that assertion pop up and then we can go to the boom folks, go to the rocket folks and our debug cycle can be, uh, can be a lot quicker. What are the cons? Obviously we don't get waveform or state so we're, we kind of have limited visibility. Uh, again, assertions are best added when we're writing the code rather than, we're de rather than we're, when we're debugging because uh, we don't know what we're debugging uh, when we're debugging. And if we spr sprinkle a large number of printfs across our entire design, this will slow, slow down simulation. So one of the nice things about FireSim is we don't have to enable all our debugging features all at the same time. We can enable uh, uh, these uh, debugging features individually. So for most of the time, I'm running without synthesizable printfs, although the printfs are there. But when I need them, I can enable build with synthesizable printf, and then I will have that uh, debugging feature which will slow down my simulation performance, but will give me more visibility. So some, uh, sometimes we have, we, we work in a joint team, we work in an agile team, and we have more software-oriented engineers, people that need to write uh, drivers, firm, firmware, operating systems, so they're not necessarily fond of waveforms and, and uh, hardware-oriented uh, debugging techniques. Uh, they're more familiar with assembly instruction, instruction traces, et cetera. So we add this uh, bridge in FireSim that's called Tracer 5. And what Tracer 5 does, it connects to the trace ports of Rocket and Boom and offloads these uh, cycle-accurate instruction traces all, all out of band. So if we compare this to usually connecting to trace ports, we will either have to back pressure the trace port by stopping our target software or, or impacting our real hardware or we will be very limited in, the, in, in our trace size that we can offload because that's the amount of uh, uh, the sampling window we have on our trace port without, uh, without actually uh, pressuring our actual hardware. But the advantage of FireSim and this token-based back pressuring mechanism is that we can do this complete cycle accurate trace offload without impacting any of the behavior of our, our simulated hardware. Um, uh, so by default, the, these trace ports, uh, trace ports have uh, interesting information such as in instruction addresses, privilege levels, uh, exception status, and these trace ports can generate a lot of data very quickly, terabytes of data incredibly fast. Uh, so in order to kind of resolve this problem of generating a lot of data, so uh, this Tracer 5 also has a trigger mechanism. So we can trigger the trace to to output a trace only of a particular window of interest, and that particular window of interest can depend on the target software that is running on our simulated hardware based on some cu uh, custom instruction, uh, a no-op or something, or it can be based on the behavior of the simulation, so some uh, window of cycles or the, or the PC within the simulated hardware, and that way we reduce our, uh, our, our trace size very much and we can look at a particular uh, area of focus within a region of interest rather than looking at an entire trace uh, since the beginning of simulation. Uh, another advantage of this uh, trigger mechanism is that we can use the same trigger that is, that is based on information from this trace port in other debugging features such as auto counter, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, or, or potentially printf and, and other mechanisms in the future in order to kind of narrow down the window that we're looking at and which both improves simulation performance and helps us uh, filter out the noise uh, from uh, large uh, amounts of debugging info. Uh, so what are the type of things we want to use this type of uh, 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 Tracer 5 for? So this is very useful when we talk about kernel or hypervisor level uh, cycle sensitive profiling, whether we're talking about drivers or the actual uh, operating system uh, level stuff, because we're talking about stuff that any perturbation of the actual simulated hardware will affect the thing that we're looking at. Uh, so some examples of uh, things that we've done with it are co-optimization of a NIC and a, and a network driver. We have folks from the Keystone Secure Enclave project that have also used Tracer 5 to debug uh, uh, their Enclave and other uh, high-performance, hardware-specific code that we really want to look at a cycle-accurate uh, mechanism. And uh, we will talk a bit more about this uh, co-optimization of the NIC and the network driver in ASCOS 2020 uh, in, if you're in the academic conference uh, genre. Um, so what are the pros and cons of uh, debugging using this Tracer 5 mechanism? Obviously, uh, it's out of band, so there is no impact on the workload ex execution. It's a software-centric method, so you can give a trace to your software engineers. They don't need to know how to write, uh, to read waveforms, uh, et cetera. And you will get large amounts of data, and this is the age of big data, so um, 
uh, you can extract any amount of information you can from that. Uh, what are the cons here? It does slow down simulation performance because we need to use this back pressuring mechanism to offload all, the, all this data. You don't get hardware visibility. And again, this large amount of data also generates a large amount of noise. Uh, so you need to have techniques to filter that out. So in that ASPOS presentation, we also talk about various uh, integration with vi visualization tools to kind of handle this amount of data and get profiling information. So the final feature I'm going to talk about uh, is called Auto Counter, which is this automatic uh, uh, performance counter insertion that David talked about. Uh, it's a fairly new feature. And the idea is to uh, use these performance counters, again, out of band without impacting uh, target simulation and, 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 and having the same back pressuring issues uh, we have with actual hardware. Uh, so the way we use auto counter is we have some piece of hardware. We annotate uh, 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 several uh, uh, signals with, uh, with an auto, auto counter annotation, which I'll mention a bit about uh, a couple of APIs that we have. And then FireSim just adds these counters out of band, which means it's not part of your main uh, RTL source repository. You're not going to tape out these counters. These counters are there just for simulation purposes because you're trying to do validation and verification of the performance and behavior of, uh, of, of your RTL. Um, so these, the results of these counters can be exported at any rate you want. So you can say, I want to read this counter every 10,000 cycles, every 100,000 cycles, every million cycles. And this will actually impact the performance of your simulation. So if you read performance counters every million cycles, your simulation will likely not suffer any performance degradation. But if you read performance counters every 10,000 cycles, this will slow down uh, your simulation. And you can configure this read rate at runtime. Uh, so you can choose kind of to trade off visibility and performance. Uh, so again, this is very useful for software profiling and optimization, and it gives you some uh, microarchitecture visibility, so we can count cache hits and some other things, but we can also count uh, details in a NIC and uh, the, uh, the number of elements in a queue, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, um, oh yeah, and you get a nice output file that gives you uh, the cycle the counter was read and all the values of the various counters uh, you added um, in a nice output file that you can ingest. Uh, so AutoCounter currently has two APIs. Uh, one is similar to the FPGA debug uh, and, uh, function we, uh, we mentioned earlier. So we have a perf counter function where you just wrap a signal, you give the counter some name and description, and that will generate the counters, wire everything up, uh, and, and generate those now nice output files. Uh, now, if you have events of interest that um, y you think are of interest to many people and you're working on open source repositories, but you don't always want to ge generate counters uh, out of those. So the rocket, re rocket chip repository has uh, these nice unimplemented cover functions uh, that have many pre-annotated events of interest. So whether it's cache hits or, 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 or stuff like that. And so what we do in FireSim, uh, we take these cover functions and we implement them as uh, um, th these perf counters uh, perf counter annotations, so, uh, so you can turn them on as counters when you want, and when you, when you turn them off, then it's just the same uh, unimplemented uh, cover function. Uh, one additional mechanism we add on top of the cover functions is that is to filter at a module granularity, because we assume that you don't want to generate counters for all the cover functions you have in Rocketship. You're interested in counters for a very particular module of interest, uh, so we add filtering at a module granularity uh, as opposed to doing everything with these uh, cover functions. So again, what are the pros and cons uh, of, of, of auto counter? Again, it's out of band. It's coarser granularity than printf, but it still provides some microarchitectural visibility. Uh, and we can use it, utilize these uh, permanent uh, cover points that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, some, some cons of this, uh, we get information only about events that, are being ca that can be counted, not about any uh, sequ sequential process of events. Uh, again, it requires rebuilding the FPGA images uh, to uh, um, enable the counters. And if we read the counters too frequently, uh, this will affect simulation performance. Uh, so just to recap what we're trying to do with debugging features in FireSim, we're kind of trying to thread this trade-off between visibility and performance. So we want to enable you to turn on the debugging features that you want when you are willing to slow down simulation performance and you need more visibility. But you should be able to turn everything off and get this high, uh, um, uh, high speed uh, FPGA uh, simulation performance when you, when you feel everything is comfortable and you don't need visibility. And again, keep everything uh, low cost using these cloud FPGAs. Uh, while trying to get as close as we can to the debugging level of, uh, of these more sophisticated uh, hardware emulators. 
So now I'm gonna kind of switch very sharply to talking about uh, this multi-FPGA uh, network simulation, uh, which is um, not very related to debugging, but it is uh, another very nice feature of FireSim. So this was actually FireSim's uh, original uh, claim for fame uh, in ISCA 2018, and, uh, and only then uh, it was kind of led to this more uh, single node emulation. Um, but we, we do want to enable a network simulations of multiple nodes. So we enable this using a, 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 a fairly uh, basic uh, level of network parameters. So we allow you to configure at runtime link latency, the switch latency, and, and, uh, and the network bandwidth. And this is done using a, a software model of a switch. And you can find all of these in your config runtime that David mentioned earlier. So uh, the main thing about uh, simulating a network is uh, kind of describing a, your network topology. And we, we describe all our network topologies at uh, a file called usertopologies.py, and we do this by essentially describing uh, a DAG using uh, three ty uh, two types of nodes and edges between them. So we have a FireSim server node, which represents an RTL uh, server um, implementation. We have the FireSim switch node, which represents a software model of the switch. And then we have this add downlinks function, which, which represents the edges between these switch nodes and these network nodes. And this way we can compose a network topology in a hierarchical fashion. Um, so one example that uses uh, an F116x large instance that will have an eight node configuration uh, with uh, eight server nodes and a single switch and requires a single uh, uh, F116x large instance that has uh, eight FPGAs on it. And you can see it's a fairly uh, short and concise description. So we start by, uh, by declaring the function, then we declare uh, the switch by declaring a new FireSim switch node. We declare the servers by uh, declaring eight of these FireSim server nodes. And then we connect this root switch to each of these uh, server nodes using this add downlinks function. So a fairly uh, simple and concise description. But as we can see here, uh, this is a, heterogene a, a, ho a homogeneous network topology. All our server nodes are the same. Uh, but in an interesting network situation, we want to have some heterogeneous nodes. So have some nodes that have some accelerators, some nodes that have larger memory, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this FireSim server node also takes several arguments, and one, one of particular interest is this uh, server hardware config. And this one takes an entry from your uh, config hardware DB that David mentioned earlier, and we can uh, design, we can specify for each of the nodes what type of hardware it has. So this way we can generate heterogeneous network topologies. Uh, another feature of interest when you talk about uh, networking simulation in FireSim is this uh, super node feature. So we found that um, uh, standard rocket ship or boom use a fairly uh, small portion of the FPGA. Uh, so we can actually fit multiple node simulations within a, si a single FPGA. So we do that using a feature called uh, super node. And this essentially packs multiple, ser uh, multiple server simulations on a single FPGA. And that way it allows us to uh, simulate a larger network using uh, less resources. It requires some special handling when we describe the network topologies, uh, but uh, that is mainly uh, uh, the gist of this. And, uh, and as a demonstration, we can do much more complex topologies than just that eight node, uh, one switch um, model. You, we can do fat trees, we can do various other net, uh, class, various other network topologies, and you have quite a few examples of those in this user topology.py uh, file. Uh, so now that we covered the basic features of how to describe a network in FireSim, uh, I'm gonna kind of uh, go over how to build this data center scale simulation that, uh, that David described earlier with 1,024 nodes. So we started with this quad core uh, rocket ship config um, uh, that has a 16 kilobyte L1 cache, uh, a shared L2 cache. We have this uh, uh, 200 gigabit NIC implementation that we mentioned IceNet earlier today. And this utilizes less than a quarter of the FPGA. So then we do this Golden Gate uh, transformation that David talked about. We wrap, we wrap this up in, in, the de in this host target decoupling mechanism with the DRAM models, with the network models, with the block device models, and we put this on the FPGA. So this simulates at around 150 megahertz without network simulation or 40 megahertz with network simulation because we talked about uh, the back pressuring issues earlier. So now we take this single server node simulation and we use super node mode and we pack four of these onto a single FPGA. So we talked about the AWS cost earlier, so you can get a, about $1.65 uh, an hour for an on-demand instance or 50 cents for a, a spot instance. And right now we're simulating four server blades, around 16 cores, 64 gigabytes of, uh, of DDR3, and this is a single FPGA. 
So now we use the scalability of AWS. We use this F116 large instance, and, and that has eight FPGAs on it. Each FPGA now is simulating four server nodes, and we're simulating a top of rack switch on it. So we're simulating 32 server blades with 128 cores, large numbers of, uh, of DDR and network bandwidth. And all of this is at a cost of uh, around anything between 260 and 1320 an hour. And this goes down to about uh, 10, megahertz, uh, a 10 megahertz simulation performance. So again, this is the cost of the network simulation, but it's still orders of magnitude faster than any software simulation mechanism you can use for this, at least 1,000x. 1, 1, so again, using the scalability of Amazon AWS, so now we can, we can instantiate multiple of these instances. So now we're using eight of these F116 large instances. We add another switch model, and we're simulating 256 uh, server blades. And then we can uh, scale up another level and instantiate 64 of these instances. So they, now we have 1,024 server simulations. We're simulating all these big numbers, 4,000 uh, 4, cores, 16 terabytes of DDR3, 32 top of rack switches. So a, a fairly reasonable cluster simulation at 6.6 .6, um, megahertz uh, of simulation performance. So the bottom line is we harness at least uh, a large number of FPGA here. I think it's 256 uh, FPGAs uh, to simulate a large data center which is globally uh, cycle accurate, and this costs only hundreds of dollars per hour. Now, the, the reason we say only is because if we would have used the CapEx to buy all these FPGAs, this would have been millions, uh, millions of dollars. So being able to do this for such a low cost and, you, and do this only for the time that we need it is uh, very beneficial to small agile teams, academics, startups, et cetera. Uh, so some community updates about FireSim, which the animation kind of broke. Uh, so there are companies that have a public in, announced that they're using FireSim, whether it's uh, Esperanto with their Maxion or Intensive 8 with their Intense Core. Uh, we have Chipyard integration, which uh, was a very significant uh, step because now you can use this integrated uh, environment. We'll talk about the VLSI flow in a few minutes. We talked about uh, um, using this uh, unified generator. There are multiple projects that are using FireSim, uh, whether it's, uh, there are a few forks of the NVDLA that are using FireSim, uh, the Watch of Vector Accelerator, the Keystone uh, Secure Enclave. Uh, we've had multiple academic units. Uh, we're uh, very much putting an emphasis on education using FireSim, so it is used in a couple of Berkeley classes. Uh, we've held tutorials uh, here last year and in a variety of other academic conferences. Um, we have a large, a large and active mailing list and uh, quite a few cloners. Uh, so some recent feature updates in the latest ver version of FireSim. So we talked about go the Golden Gate optimizing compiler and this ability to, uh, um, to utilize the FPGA resources much better. So David mentioned going from four booms to uh, six booms. Um, we're, gonna be, we're able to process serialized uh, fertile in the next version. So that's going to uh, improve this uh, unified flow with the rest of the Shipyard framework. And we talked about FireSim as a library as opposed to a standalone uh, framework as itself. Some more upcoming features is uh, better black box Verilog support via external uh, clock gating, multiple clock domains. Um, we talked about the, this auto counter and trigger mechanisms and again, uh, more unified generators. Uh, so just to recap uh, the FireSim chapter of this talk, uh, so we can prototype a a scalable systems using arbitrary RTL and using this elasticity of the cloud, using software models and hardware models together. The simulation is automatically built and deployed, so this convenience feature is very nice. We, there have been multiple FPGA accelerated simulators in Berkeley in the past, but this automation is really uh, enabling the rest of our group to use it and, uh, and people outside of Berkeley. And we're deploying real workload, whether it's memcached, uh, or, uh, or, or other Linux-based uh, workloads. And again, it's open source, no CapEx. You run it elastically on Amazon EC2 F1. And again, you can evaluate, you can debug, you can scale out. And uh, FireSim is very useful for all the reasons that David mentioned earlier to do uh, uh, software dev, pre-silicon validation, verification, et cetera. Uh, so that will recap uh, the FireSim chapter. Uh, we do not have time for questions, so we're going to uh, skip directly to the VLSI flow, and then we will answer questions jointly at the end, assuming we will have time. Thank you. 200 slides in. We got only 50 more. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, so I'm Colin. I'm going to be talking about the VLSI flow that comes with the chipyard. Uh, we call the tool Hammer. Uh, highly agile masks made effortlessly from RTL. Name doesn't mean very much. Um, but uh, so basically, this is 
uh, we've seen this slide before where you show all these chips that we built with you know, tens of grad students, build tens of chips uh, at Berkeley, and you, know, you can't just get this for free. It requires real VLSI work to build a lot of silicon like this. Uh, and so how do we do that? Man. Okay, so uh, the advertised VLSI flow that you see in courses or from a cadence rep or a synopsis rep is just, you know, here's your Verilog, you run it through the synthesis tool, out comes your gates, that goes through the place and route tool, and you get a GDS, and it works every time. Um, but unfortunately, it's not that easy, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows. You know, your real VLSI flow has a million other steps from PDKs to bad standard cells to many iterations on synthesis to DRC, LVS, timing, power constraints, there's a million other things you have to do to get it right and make sure your chip works uh, at your desired uh, frequency and QOR. So this is where uh, we start talking about Hammer. So uh, in order to avoid this problem where these physical design VLSI flows are basically uh, rebuilt each time or largely rebuilt for each project, uh, there's a lot of overhead in that process because uh, if you have to change CAD tool vendors, or uh, you have to change for new process technology, or you change the design itself, all of your collateral that you've generated for your previous designs basically is null and void, and so you start from scratch with a whole new set of constraints, a whole new set of commands, a whole new set of issues that you haven't seen before. And so why are these flows so complicated? I mean, it's, it's a reasonable thing to be complicated. These chips are really big. There's a lot of components going on. Um, and as Moore's Law continues to slowly trickle forward, we get more and more complexity in our chips. Um, but also there's a little bit of a problem with the way the EDA industry evolved. It's like this organic bottom-up approach of lots of different patches and acquisitions and all this kind of cruft has evaluated over time. So there was never a clean slate design where you have, uh, you know, like a common exchange format or real clean APIs. And so as a result, all of these, um, all the concerns with your CAD tools and your design concerns and your process technology concerns all get kind of mixed together to a single large magic tickle script that produces your chip. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the complexity of designs these days. Um, so one thing that Hammer started to tackle for us was we once we moved from these you know single core chips, these many core chips, we had to deal with hierarchical design um, and. Uh, the minor chips are just so large, uh, you can't just give your billion transistor design to the CAD tool and have it spit out uh, you know, a GDS. Um, so you use a hierarchical design to divide and conquer this problem. Uh, but it's not free to do that. You incur a lot of costs in your designers and your physical designers. Um, you need to deal with uh, more complicated floor plans where you have to line up all the uh, power straps, bumps, placement sites, pins, things like that. Um, and once you uh, have hierarchical design, you're going to need to have the logical hierarchy of your design match the physical hierarchy. So how are you going to figure out how to make that transformation? That's something that Shipyard can help with. Uh, uh, and then also we have much more, many more boundaries. Uh, and so like your timing constraints also need to be updated. So Hammer helps a lot in simplifying this, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, but the other part that I was mentioning about this mixing of all these concerns can be really easily seen in an example of something like uh, this slide where we have uh, this is a hypothetical power strap creation command. So you want to put down power straps for your design. And so we've highlighted all the different concerns and how they're intermixed in these few lines of tickle. Uh, basically, the command itself and all of its options are tool specific, so they're highlighted in orange here. Uh, and then in green, we have highlighted all of the technology specific things. So the names of your layers, the directions of them, the minimum widths and spacings. And then also you have design specific things, you know, the names of your power domains, uh, how many uh, nets or how many groups you want per uh, module, all the module names. And so you're also gonna have, you know, one of these for each of the layers that you want power straps on. And so this is kind of this mess of all of the three concerns that you want separate. They're all just jumbled together in your tickle scripts. So Hammer has this principle, a uh, common principle applied, uh, separation of concerns. Uh, and so the solution, as always in computer science, is to add a layer of abstraction. Uh, so we're going to have, you know, we're going to have these three categories, you know, the tool the tool concerns, the design concerns, and the tech concerns. And Hammer's goal is going to be to allow you to specify 
all of the different parts of those uh, separately. And so this will help you allow reusability. So you can you know, give someone your design specification or they can give you their tool, uh, their tool plugin or their tuck plugin and you can interchangeably use them. Uh, this also helps reduce the scope of knowledge people need to contribute to Hammer in the sense that uh, you can be an expert in your design and produce a good design specification or you can be an expert in a tool and add new tool features for other Hammer users. And then with this separation of concerns, we'll build uh, abstractions and APIs uh, for, the, for the different things that each of the tools and technologies can sp supply. Okay, uh, so digging in a little bit more into what each of these uh, types of concerns uh, entails. Uh, so the design concerns, probably the thing that most people are familiar with. This is things like uh, your floor plan, what your physical hierarchy is, where you're placing things, pin constraints, uh, also includes things like clock constraints, you know, frequencies, delays on input outputs, uh, and even things like design modifications, like what modules need to be retimed. Uh, and so Hammer stores, choose to store these as in an intermediate representation, uh, basically an IR, uh, that this is emitted from some higher level source code, maybe uh, from Chisel or you know, some other Python script that's generating it. Uh, and then it's consumed by Hammer to produce the tickle commands that run the tools. Uh, Hammer also performs quality and sanity checks on these to make sure you haven't done anything stupid that's gonna shoot yourself in the foot. Um, and so we have these tool plugins that you know, transform this IR into tickle. And I'll talk about that now. So some of the other tool concerns we have are basically uh, what I'll call site level problems, which is uh, for my installation on my computer, where are the tools installed, uh, where the license server is, what versions do I have, uh, and so these are all configurable and overridable in Hammer. Uh, also then, then we also have the tickle interface, which is the more complicated part. It's not standardized across vendors, and they don't even have to preserve the APIs across versions. They can change willy-nilly. So Hammer needs a way to deal with both of those things. And so the solution here is to basically implement uh, Python methods that emit this tickle. Uh, there's kind of like an abstract class for, you know, say place and route tool, and then each, each tool implements uh, the subset of those steps. Uh, in addition, tool plugins can have vendor-specific steps that are uh, not large Hammer APIs. And we'll talk more about uh, how Hammer evolves in a second. But to deal, deal with the last concern that I haven't talked about, this is the technology concern. So this is basically the, th what you would expect here, where all of your uh, PDKs are installed, all the technology files live, what, what your standard cells are look like, uh, the SRAMs you have, other IP, and then like what kind of uh, corners they're at, they're characterized at. And then it's also possible in your technology plugin to have tool specific or technology specific tickle commands or snippets. Uh, and so there are Python methods provided in Hammer to allow you to include those automatically uh, in your flow if using that technology. Okay, so I've been mentioning plugins. Uh, so in order to deal with the separation of concerns, Hammer supports basic uh, plugins for each of the tools that it has or uh, technologies it supports. Uh, so this is basically, you'll have a place and route tool uh, plugin for Innovis, or you'll have a synthesis plugin for design compiler. Um, these are basically structured with uh, a set of default settings for the tool and defaults like YAML. And then these are overridable, obviously, by your project specific settings. Uh, and then it has this Python file that contains basically the subclass implementation of whatever tool it's uh, designed for. Technology plugins are slightly more complex. Um, so there's the tech JSON, which is basically just a bunch of pointers to uh, PDK files. Uh, might be dependent on your site, but there's a way to handle that in Hammer. Uh, then there's also another default YAML, which is the settings that the technology supports and how you can override those. Uh, and finally, the slightly more complicated part is uh, pointers to reusable Python code that you might need for a specific tool for this technology. So there's kind of like potentially a cross product here of uh, different steps you include. So Hammer IR, what does it look like? Uh, so this is codifying your design information and the settings changes for your design. Uh, it can override tech or tool specific settings as well as uh, your design specific ones. It works in both JSON and YAML. Uh, YAML is slightly nicer because it supports comments, um, but 
either are supported by Hammer. There are namespaces, which basically separate categories of settings, uh, make it easier to understand and grok uh, what's being added. I'll go through some more examples of this in a bit. But first, I want to talk about one problem that Hammer helps you solve, why you, why you should switch to using Hammer. Uh, basically, we're going to uh, dive into power straps. So uh, as I was mentioning before, power straps can be uh, tricky to get right. You need to know a lot about your technology, your design, uh, you know, your DRC rules, how much power you expect to dissipate, what, how much IR drop you can handle, uh, where your power domains are, how they're switched on and off, and things like that. Uh, and then if you switch to a hierarchical design, you know, all your tiled modules need to be pitch matched or, you know, matched your bump width or other constraints come in. Uh, and it's really easy to make mistakes when you're trying to calculate offsets and widths and, and such. And so Hammer's idea is uh, we're going to try to avoid having the designer have to do all this math uh, because it's actually, you know, pretty easy to codify and we're going to write it down in a, in a tech agnostic and tool agnostic way. Um, and so basically the method here is, you know, determine the valid pitches based on your hierarchy, uh, automatically calculate the offsets for these hierarchical blocks, and then generate your layout optimal DRC clean straps. And hopefully this will allow us to specify our intent for our power straps at a higher level than just widths and spaces and uh, length units. So we're going to walk through an example of what the by track specification in Hammer is. Uh, so this is a representation of routing tracks in your design. And so here we're going to use Hammer's by tracks power strap method, uh, which basically is uh, we can specify how wide we want each of our power straps to be in terms of routing tracks on the current layer. Uh, and so here we say it should be four routing tracks wide. And you see what in the default Hammer configuration, we just have a power and a ground. So that's two power nets, and we'll have eight, uh, eight tracks used. Then if we say we want to use 50% of our routing tracks for power, then Hammer is able to do this calculation to figure out the pitch should be 16. And it'll automatically calculate the distances and offsets in nanometers for you. And then we can tell it what layers you want these straps on. Um, and so then it automatically places them down. And then we can route our design, and we get the expected you know, utilization where we can use all of the tracks that are even right next to the power straps. Um, this is just co correctly calculated um, from Hammer's internal knowledge of the technology. Uh, this gives us this higher level abstraction that we were looking for, where we can do, you know, 10% power utilization, we run IR drop, we got problems, so then we up it to 30%, and you can see that single parameter creates uh, a whole new set of power straps that is DRC uh, LVS clean, but provides us a much better, more robust power network. So. Now we're going to talk about um, how you can actually use Hammer. So this is going through the right-hand side of that flowchart we saw earlier. So in the Chipyard VLSI folder, uh, Hammer is in there. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to use than the rest of our plugins, because, or the rest of our stuff in Chipyard, because the tool vendors and the technology people won't let us just open source all of our work. Um, but uh, if you want to talk to us, we can help you get access if you have access to various uh, tools or technologies. Um, and so the priority use case this is designed for is people like me at Berkeley who are building lots of chips and want to do it quickly uh, with as few people as possible. So uh, we're not working on open source alternatives to proprietary CAD tools. We're just using the ones that we have right now. Um, yeah, so uh, this is basically... You have a custom chipyard design. You've you know mixed in your SHA-3 accelerator that you just wrote, and you're thinking about what am I going to do with it now? Well, if you want to write a paper, then you know you can. If you have access to CAD tools, you can just use Hammer with our ASAP7 plugin. Uh, if not, maybe you can look at open source plugin, uh, open source CAD tools like the Open Road Project. Um, if you're looking to make a chip, then hopefully you have access to CAD tools, and you can sign the NDA. We can trade uh, tech plugins with you. And if not, uh, that's going to be a tough. But at this point, if we had more time, we would be doing an interactive demo with Hammer. Um, but instead, I'm just going to kind of walk you through what would happen with it. Uh, so this demo is using Cadence and Mentor plugins, which, uh, again, licensing stuff. But if you have access to those tools, you can come to us and we can share the plugins with you. Um, 
And then it uses ASAP7, which is a predictive model PDK developed by Arizona State, free to use for us as academics. Um, requires payment for commercial use, but uh, you can see more information at their website. Um, and this demo basically walks through how to use Hammer to get uh, DRC clean GDS out. Okay. Uh, so we're going to talk about the, the Shafi example we saw before uh, and how that gets pushed through a simple physical design process, uh, mixing in all the tool plugins and tech plugins that we already have available. And so for the technology, we're going to be using the ASAP7, which I mentioned. Uh, you can see this just in uh, Chipyard as a public uh, open source part because ASAP7 is open source. Um, then we're going to be using, like I said, the Cadence plugins, uh, Genus for Synthesis, Innovis for PNR, um, VCS for Simulation, and Mentor's uh, Caliber for DRC and LVS. Uh, so this is a reminder, we've got these two types of plugins for tools and technologies. Uh, they've got these different files, so we'll look at what's there. So this is ASAP7's default.yaml, which basically shows the, the default settings you'll get if you use ASAP7. Uh, they have a particular stack up. Um, there's some details on where the standard cell rail is, tap cells, core sites, things like that. Um, if you wanted to write a new tech plugin, uh, basically it's the, the process is just you know turning this unstructured knowledge you have about your technology, turning into the structured Hammer IR. Uh, we have a read the docs page as well. This will come up several times on the slides, but hammer-vlsi.readthedocs.io, also linked to from Chipyard Stocks. Uh, for the tool plugins, this isn't an exact tool plugin because we have to obfuscate them for Euler reasons, but um, basically this is you know one of the example uh, Python snippets that you're going to need that your tool plugin will have, where it's you know how do I initialize the environment? What do I what, how do I read in all the IP and uh, files like that? Again, ask us for access if you have access. Uh, if you want to write a new CAD plugin, it's basically just implementing a series of these APIs for your specific tool uh, in Python. It'd be good to start with reading the docs. Okay. Um, so the design concerns is the other part that I haven't talked about for the example yet. And basically this is you know, the core of the process where you figure out how to do your floor plan, what your clocking looks like, hierarchy, assembly, you select your process node and technology and tools, um, and how you integrate IP. Uh, in this example we have a, a, DC, a dummy DCO um, for a black box to show how that works. Um, yeah, so uh, in, VLS, in the VLSI folder, we have uh, example VLSI is a script that uh, modifies Hammer's entry scripts by adding extra steps for the ASAP7 technology. Um, the example.yaml included in there is project specific Hammer IR for the SHA3 accelerator. Uh, there's a place to store extra collateral like uh, libs, lefts, and GDSs. Um, again, these demo files will be provided afterwards. Um, uh, yeah, so basically everything can be everything about your design is included in example.yaml, but if you wanted to, you could separate them out into different uh, different files for better organization. And then you know the easy hammer is a, basically a command line interface tool. So hammer VLSI, give it all of your YAMLs at set different settings, and then you can run uh, like sin is in action, and those generate the tickle scripts that then run the tools. So if we look at um, this example YAML, you'll see that we select the ASAP7 technology uh, in the middle there, VLSI core technology, uh, and then uh, we might point to where the tarball is because that's how ASAP7 is distributed. Hammer will then automatically unpack it uh, and know where everything is. Um, here we're selecting what tools, plugins we're going to use. So we're selecting ones that already exist. Yellow is showing us the synthesis where we set uh, we pick genus, uh, point to where that lives in our file hierarchy, and pick a version. Uh, green highlight here is picking our place around tool, Innovis, um, where it lives, what version it has, a couple of other options there. And then uh, blue, we're picking you know, using Caliber for DRC and LVS. Uh, so this is just setting up all the paths to our tools uh, and picking versions we want. 
And so Hammer automatically knows based on these versions what commands can and can't it can and can't emit. Um, so this is some actual design collateral here. Basically, you specify the clock and clock constraints for your design. Uh, this is just a simple design, so there's just a single clock uh, with a gigahertz frequency and a little bit of uncertainty. Uh, here's a little, uh, uh, Hammer can also automatically generate simple power specifications. So here we are setting it to just automatically generate a CPF for our, you know, single power domain design. Um, for the placement constraints, uh, the example.yaml includes a, a simple floor plan for this design, uh, which is basically just one top level box that is 300 by 300 in yellow here. Uh, it adds a little obstruction at the bottom, which Hammer can also do, obviously, um, and blue at the bottom. That's for fixing DRCs. And then the green box in the middle is the dummy DCO's placement, which so this has both uh, width and a height as well as an XY position. Um, so the next thing we have here is uh, pin placement. So this design is uh, just a smaller block that's designed to be in in integrated hierarchically into a larger design. Uh, so we need to specify pins that connect to the outer level of design. So that's basically, um, you can see here we're using another semi-automatic semi -automatic mode from Hammer. So it uses semi-auto here, which is essentially giving you control over what layers and what uh, sides of your block the pins come out of, but it gives the CAD tool freedom to you know, spread them out however it see fits on those sides. It's worth noting that Hammer's smart enough to tell you if you've put uh, your layers on the wrong side. If they're, for example, horizontal and you put them on the bottom, it will yell at you. So that's nice. Uh, here's the power straps that we're using in the example one. This is pretty similar to what we walked through before, the by tracks mode. Um, some little differences here you can notice is that we uh, are able to override some of the defaults per layer. So we have a default power utilization of just 5% on the lower levels, but then uh, for the upper levels, M8 and M9, we're specifying 100%, so that's kind of simulating you know, a very thick grid at the top with a uh, more sparse grid at the bottom of where the routing is happening. Uh, if we want to integrate this you know, dummy DCO or other analog IP or hard IP, whatever you have, third-party stuff, um, Hammer supports that with this extra libraries command or extra libraries parameter. Uh, basically, you can specify uh, lists of, you know, library files, left files, GDSs, uh, tell Hammer what corner their uh, corner and voltage there, uh, characterize that, and then it can automatically use them in your design. For this one, because the DCO is just a, a fake dummy, uh, it's specified as physical only, which Hammer also supports. Um, so going back to uh, how Hammer evolves over time, I guess. Uh, we have this concept of hooks, uh, which is basically our idea is, is this is how Hammer evolves over time and gains new features. So we're pretty confident that we're not going to get rid of all the magical tickle scripts that people have lying around. All that expertise captured in them uh, isn't just going to go away, and we're just only going to use Hammer. So, and also, Hammer is still under development. And so um, in order to enable people to add their, use their already existing knowledge in Hammer, Hammer has this concept of hooks, which are basically uh, the insertion of custom Python or tickle scripts within your Hammer generated flow. Um, so this allows you to implement quick workarounds or hacks um, and allows you to prototype future APIs much more quickly uh, without Hammer kind of hammer, hampering you, which is, can be a, an often a problem with new flow tools. Um, so an example of that is, you know, you have this technology supplied hook for ASAP7. It has this weird quirk that you need to scale down the GDS after you do placement route because uh, of reasons. And basically, uh, the Hammer plugin for ASAP7 provides the script that does that, uh, and it automatically registers itself with the flow part of Hammer to run after you've written the GDS, uh, which is called write design. And this is, this is needed because Hammer doesn't have this step by default. It doesn't automatically scale down the GPS or up after writing it, but in this particular technology, we need that. And so there's a simple method to include this, and then anyone who uses this ASAP7 technology plugin 
gets the correct GDS out at the end. Um, this is showing where we add that hook, the scale final GDS, to after write uh, design. And this is little hook system is pretty easy to add stuff after other steps, before other steps, things like that. So you can uh, quickly add your uh, fixes or workarounds to your flow. Uh, Hammer also supports um, a makefile based build system. So it can automatically generate a makefile based on your hierarchical design um, and uh, basically allows you to do things like you know, make JDRC and it's going to fan out to all of the possible subcomponents, uh, build them up and all, all the possible sub steps that it can um, and just uh, put it all together for you without you having to invoke the hammer command line interface each time. That gets us much closer to this idea where we just have, uh, you know, logic design goes in, you type make and it just builds the whole chip for you with running DRC and LVS. Um, I'm gonna skip through. These are what you would see if you were actually doing uh, the demo interactively, but I'll skip through that because we're running out of time. So we used Hammer to tape out uh, several chips, pretty large chips, um, but we're still working on it actively. Basically, uh, Hammer IR lends itself well to this physical design generator flow. Uh, so you know, using higher level uh, designs to automatically generate your lower level uh, collateral. Um, so that's already what we're doing, uh, but we're still working on things like a Scala API so that uh, you can more easily tie your physical design collateral into your chisel generators, um, dealing with uh, composable floor plans using aspect-oriented chisel, uh, making sure your floor plans are valid and sane for your complex hierarchical designs, uh, and then automatically generating clock constraints from a fertile design as well. Uh, it's also important for us to be able to update our chisel designs based on physical design feedback. So uh, one of my other colleagues is working on trying to close that loop to do design space exploration better. Uh, we also need a few more sign off tools, not just DRC and LVS, but uh, you know, things like uh, IR drop, dynamic power analysis, and logical equivalency checking. All of these are in progress, but not quite uh, ready for the public yet. And then we also have more physical design APIs are getting added all the time. So in summary, uh, physical design is hard, and there are good reasons why a lot of people try to avoid it, but uh, as chips grow in complexity and EDA tools continue to be annoying to use, uh, Hammer is trying to help separate these concerns between designs, tools, and technologies to enable more reuse in the same way we can see uh, in some of the RTL frameworks coming up now, like Chipyard. And so if you are trying to get numbers for your paper and you have access to commercial CAD tools, it's really easy to just open up Hammer, use the open source PDK, and get results very quickly. And so now we'll take questions about the rest of all of Chipyard. Do you have any um, methods or um, improvements built into this for version control, especially on kind of the EDA tool outputs that you might want to save, um, but not put into Git or something like that? Um, yeah, so we have some metadata tracking there where you can uh, keep track of your runs, but and there's more thoughts on the for the for design space exploration stuff that my other colleague's working on. He's looking at getting more interesting information out of that that's tracked without putting in a Git, like you're saying. Um, but not not too much work on that, yeah. And then the second question was, uh, what do you estimate the time that it takes? I guess beyond just switching to a new PDK, but to also bring Hammer up on a new PDK? So that question is, I would say, pretty difficult to estimate. It depends widely on the PDK you're given. Uh, so for like, you know, a relatively nice foundry, <laughs> I would say uh, you can get, you know, you can get GDS out in, you know, maybe a day. But then DRC clean, right, that's a whole separate process in a new PDK. And have you found one foundry particularly better suited for Hammer than others? Uh, well, so we've brought it up on three or four foundries. Um, and I mean, in the same way, it was certain different foundries were harder to work with when you were writing the script yourself. I, I wouldn't say Hammer hurts or helps that. Okay. 
Sorry, uh, this was a question uh, for Alan that I asked earlier. Um, uh, it's, is ASPLOS 2020 the, um, the conference at which you'll have the full day interactive tutorial on Shipyard? He says yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right, do you want to do these last slides? So we've got some wrap-up slides that Alan's going to run through. Okay, so three quick slides to recap what we did over the past uh, two and a half hours. So we talked about this end-to-end -end architecture chip design exploration using uh, Chipyard and FireSim. So we talked about this multi-flow infrastructure in uh, Chipyard about uh, targeting different Verilog types, whether it's for VLSI, FPGA accelerator simulation, or software RTL simulation. We talked about how to compose uh, the different SOCs using the uh, genera generators you can find uh, in Chipyard. Uh, whether it's uh, rock accelerators, MMIO accelerators, heterogeneous uh, SOCs, peripherals, et cetera. Uh, we talked about how to uh, add uh, and simulate these custom accelerators, so Abe talked about that. Uh, Colin just covered uh, in very briefly the Hammer VLSI flow. And then we also talked about FireSim, this full system FPGA accelerated simulation framework, uh, about the compiler and manager components, which David uh, covered, about debugging instrumentation, and about network simulation that uh, I covered. Uh, so, uh, this has been used both in industry and academia. We have uh, quite a few users. We have, uh, there's both a FireSim mailing list and a Chipyard mailing list uh, where you can find some answers to questions that were previously asked. All the development is open source and on GitHub. We have a stable master branch with the latest release. Uh, we have a less stable uh, dev branch if you're looking for all the newest features. So like some of the new features that I mentioned earlier, they'll, they'll be find on, found on the dev branch. Uh, so as you may have seen, Chipyard is a composition of, of multiple sub-projects, so whether it's the Boom project, the Rocket Chip project, uh, the FireSim project, the Hammer project, et cetera. Uh, so these projects are uh, managed using sub-modules, but everything is integrated under the Chipyard framework. Um, we have over 100 pages of documentation, and we're getting pretty good at this. Uh, so if uh, something isn't clear in, in, the, in that documentation, uh, please let us know. Uh, we really appreciate feedback, and we appreciate PRs uh, even more. Uh, so most of the information you need can be found in this set of links. So you have the Chipyard links, whether it's the GitHub re repo, the docs, or the mailing list, uh, and you have the FireSim uh, links. Uh, and again, FireSim, it, it can be standalone and as a library within Chipyard, so that's why we're uh, keeping these as, a, as a, a separate uh, link sets. Uh, so now uh, we can open it up to questions on any of the topics we covered in the past uh, two and a half hours. If we have to uh, do an equivalent um, cycle exact um, reproduction of a simulation from FPGA to software simulation, uh, is there some way I can use the DRAM model in the FireSign flow? Do you want to take this? Uh, so, so the FireSimplo uses this DDR3 um, timing model. Uh, now, if I want to run on VCS, cycle exact, reproduce it, uh, I couldn't find a configuration to use that DDR model, except through FPGA. OK. so. The question is, at a high level, how do you pull the timing you'd get using the phased memory timing model yes. into an RTL simulation, software RTL simulation? Yes. So right now, like the easiest way to do that is to simulate the simulator in an RTL simulation. So it's going to be decoupled. There's going to be obvious like stalling of the simulated time. So, like You'll see when the clock is being gated. Um, and you can do that out of the sim directory in FireSim. Okay, so so I don't I don't I don't do another build in the in the, the software simulator directory. I just use yeah. So there's a different okay. make target for doing that. Now that might not be super useful. Like ideally, what you would do is you know in Rocketship, for instance, you could use the exact same timing model, but without all of that like clock stalling stuff. And like, do, do you know what I'm saying? Like right now, if you use Rocket Chip or Chipyard, the default DRAM timing model that we provide there is just like, you know, it's a magic memory. Yeah, it's not a detailed timing model. Yeah, I, I, so I want just apples to apples. If, if either the simple model on both or the. Yeah. Uh, right. 
So, I mean, the, sh the, the apples to apples way right now is to use what we call Midas level simulation in FireSim. So if you go in Sim and you type like make run benchmark tests, you'll get that. Oh, okay, thank you. Now, but that's going to be harder to reason about for the reasons I gave before, because you're going to see host and target time. You're going to see your target being stalled and clock gated, but you can, you'll still get an apples to apples comparison to the FPGA. Okay, all right, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the, how you solve the partitioning problem across multiple FPGAs for making really large SOCs? Yeah, we haven't solved that problem yet. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think the mechanisms we have to decouple the simulation make it not quite trivial, but very easy to do partitioning. Yeah, I was gonna say, it looks like you might have a pretty good solution in the work. Yeah, it's just to date, we haven't needed to do multi-FPGA partitioning. And from a research perspective, finding out, like finding clever ways to use one FPGA better um, is something we can publish about. <laughs> so um, in the future, I think this, this is a feature we're gonna have. And I think it's not that difficult to do. It's just currently on EC2. Um, so for instance, on the 16X large instances, you have these eight FPGAs. They're actually connected to one another with this ring. Um, we don't have access to that yet. And so once we do, it'd be kind of natural to want to use that ring to partition a design over eight FPGAs. Um, and I think couple that with some of these resource optimizations that take multiple host cycles, with eight FPGAs, you can simulate some very large ASICs. Um, so stay tuned for that. Thank you. Just to clarify on your last answer, you're talking about partitioning through PCIe backplane, not through FPGA IO. So that ring isn't through PCIe, I don't think. I'm not, I'm not totally, totally, yeah. It's like a point to point connection between the FPGAs. Um, so right, what we could do right now is partition through PCIe, but then that simulator would just run abysmally slow. So unless you can get the point to point latency down to order like ones of cycles, you, you really pay a high cost for doing the partitioning. Um, so if we built our own hardware, obviously we could do a good job too, but that kind of defeats the purpose of bringing the cost down, <laughs> so. Uh, another question I had was, it's not related to that. So in, uh, I missed the first part of the presentation, so may, maybe you've already spoken about it, but is there a way to uh, bring modern system Verilog type of RCL design into the fire scene flow, or is this just strictly Gisele Fertile based? So right now, so if you were to check out FireSim, the dev branch, which is going to, is like essentially going to be the next release, um, we have a mechanism that will let you black box, say system Verilog into your chisel. And then we, based on your black box, you call out the clocks for that Verilog module. Uh, we can clock eight those. So we drop down like a enabled global clock buffer and we just clock eight your Verilog kind of dumbly, right? So we can't do any of these debugging things. We can't like introspect on that design at all currently. In the future, and we've had an undergrad work on this, what we'll do is use Yosis to parse your Verilog and then re-emit it as fertile. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, all these cool features we've been telling you about will be able to apply. So that's, uh, that's further down the road, but it's also coming. So get the performance benefits of FireSim with your black box. Yeah, so if you, if you use the black box scheme, like that'll still get you a detailed cycle exact model that is stalled with the rest of the simulator. So that would be the way I would suggest people integrate their designs. And that's what we, uh, that's what Farzad did to the NVDLA essentially. He just has this chisel black box for the NVDLA and then clock eats the whole thing, so. All right, thanks. Uh, similar, uh, the same topic. Um, so I just want to clarify, if, if, if I want to use um, Verilog through FireSim, so there are two possible approaches. One is the black box. I don't actually see why um, using clock gating for making cyclic rate simulations would be a problem for, let's say I pulled in print synthesis and print assertions, while it is being clock gated, it's not pushing model cycles. So I, would, I shouldn't miss any information at any particular cycle, right? 
Well, I think the problem right now is like you're free to put printf's and assertions throughout your chisel code, but you know if you have like you know fatal statements in your var log, currently our compiler doesn't have any means to introspect like read your var log and do the equivalent of assertion synthesis, but for var log, if that makes sense. So all we have to, as the name suggests, treat your var log as a black box. We don't know anything about what's in it. All we know is it has some clocks, and we will simply gate those clocks under the assumption it is safe to do so, right? So obviously you can't put any RTL in a black box and expect that it'll you know, still be modeled accurately under clock gating if, for instance, you had like a PLL in there, right? Oh. So uh, okay, okay, okay. Like it's only safe to do this for a certain subset of bear log designs, um, but okay. as it turns out, that's like the majority of what people are interested in adding to shipyard. So. Okay, and and uh, there is this other mm, flow, potential flaw through very log to fertile with the EOSIS that can be done still manually currently, right? I could manually just yeah, yeah. So you okay. could like you're free to use EOSIS and emit fertile from your var log. Okay, read in your var log, emit fertile, and then use that. Right. And uh, uh, so that should be a flaw. That should. That yeah. Should. So right now that takes a little bit of extra work. Okay. But if you open an issue asking okay. for that feature, we can totally make it possible to. Uh, no, no, but if I'm willing to do it manually, then no problem with that, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. And is there is there any um, any very log to chisel? Uh, let's say that I have some initial very log and then, you know, I, I also want to try out. Currently, no. No, okay. Not that I'm aware. All right. And okay. people who are more knowledgeable have also shook their heads. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs>